territorial land acknowledgement. I'm sorry, Melanie, thank you. We will start our meeting with a territorial land acknowledgement and leading us in our acknowledgement is Principal Luke from Maria Carrillo High School. And um, if you all would please join us standing for this land acknowledgement, please, thank you. I acknowledge that Santa Rosa City Schools is on the traditional territory and homelands of the Pomo people, traditional territory and homelands of the Coast Miwok people, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This land acknowledgement calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Santa Rosa City Schools more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Thank you, Principal Luke. And if you would all please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item C3 in our agenda is a report of actions taken in closed session. During the closed session, the board voted five to zero to authorize the district superintendent or her designee to adopt resolution number 2022-2341 to, no to notify one administrator 1.0 FTE that they may be released or possibly re reassigned from their position for the 2022-2023 school year pursuant to education code section 44951. During the closed session, the board voted five to zero to authorize the district superintendent or her designee to adopt resolution number 2022-2351 to notify one administrator 1.0 FTE that they may be released or possibly reassigned from their position for the 2022-2023 school year pursuant to education code section 44951. During the closed session, the board voted five to zero to authorize the district superintendent or her designee to adopt resolution number 2022-2355 to notify two probationary certificated employees that they will be non-reelected for the 2023-2024 school year pursuant to education code section 44929.21. During the closed session, the board voted five to zero to authorize the district superintendent or her designee to adopt resolution number 2022-2342 to notify one or more temporary certificated employees that they will be re released at the end of the 2022-2023 school year. Item C4 are items considered in closed session for action and open agenda. Um, for the board, we are seeking motion on student expulsion case number 22-2312. I'll make the motion. That was moved. Second. That was moved by Director Sheffield and seconded by Director Flores. Um, can we get a roll call vote, please? Director Sheffield. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director De La Cruz. No. Director Fong. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Medina. Nay. President Manieri. Nay. That vote passes. Thank you, Melanie. Um, we are seeking a motion on student expulsion case number 22-2313. Moved to approve. Second. That was moved by Director Flores and seconded by Director Fong. Roll call vote, please. Director Flores. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Oh. Director McNally. Aye. Director Medina. Nay. President Manieri. Nay. Thank you. That motion passes. And we are now on case number 22-2314. I move to approve. Second. I was moved by Director Fong and seconded by Director Flores. Roll call vote, please. Director Fong. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Sheffield. 
Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. That motion passes. Now we are on case number 22, 23, 17. Move to approve. Second. That was moved by Director Fong and seconded by Director Medina. Roll call vote, please. Director Fong. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. Now we are on item C5, statements of abstention. Are there any statements of abstention tonight from the board? Seeing none, we will move on to item C6, adjustments to the agenda, board or superintendent, Chernell, are there any adjustments? Uh, Director Medina. Yeah, I'd like to pull item F5. Okay. Are there any other um, modifications to the agenda this evening? Okay. Um, this is also the time when we ask if folks would like to make any public comment on items F5. Um, when we reach those items, um, is there anyone who would like to, to let us know that they'd like to give comment? Okay, seeing none in the, in the chambers, we'll move on to folks online. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on items in the consent portion of the agenda, those are the F items. Please raise your hand at this time. There are no hands raised. Thank you. So that brings us to C7, special presentations for student of the month and certificated and classified employees of the month. And tonight we have students, families, and school staff from Lewis Early Learning Academy and Albert Biela Elementary School. The presentations this evening will honor our students for their academics, their character, and other praiseworthy accomplishments. We will also be honoring our certificated and classified employees for their outstanding dedication and service. And joining us for these presentations, we have Principal Plack and uh, Principal Jablonski. So if you could make your way down, thank you. Yay. Good evening. This is Carlos Hernandez Rivas. Our team first met Carlos when he was two and a half years old. Since that time, he has built relationships with many of the service providers in our school and was overwhelmingly voted to receive this honor. Carlos is now a four-year-old in one of our preschool classes. He has good developing pre-academic skills, tries his best, and is willing to try new challenges. Carlos has made the most growth in his social emotional skills. He enjoys being with his peers and has learned to play nicely with them. He's a good friend, and when he sees a friend in need, he checks on them and asks, are you okay? Carlos is an energetic learner. He's full of joy and has a good sense of humor. He's had a very successful preschool experience. His teacher has reported that Carlos is an overall wonderful student who eagerly participates in all that school has to offer. I'm so very proud of him. I too am proud to recognize Carlos as the student of the month for Lewis Early Learning Academy.
Our classified employee of the month is Griselda Sanchez. Griselda has been a Santa Rosa City Schools employee for about 15 years. She served the district in various capacities as a yard duty supervisor, child care assistant, after school program lead, and special education assistant. She's currently a special education assistant in one of our preschool special day classes and has worked in this position since 2020. Griselda has a verve for life and she's full of positive energy. She enjoys time with her husband and four sons, camping, listening to 80s music and quiet time meditating. She also loves her job assisting our very young students with their development. She encourages our students to find joy in learning through song, dance, play, art, and any other fun learning activity. She takes the time to get to know each student as an individual and knows how to support each one in the special way that each one needs. She's always ready with a genuine smile and kind words for every child. In addition to all of the fun, Griselda also takes her job very seriously. She's timely, works hard, keeps everyone organized, is professional, and has great relationships with all of her colleagues. She is invaluable in the classroom and puts great effort into every aspect of her job. She's always on the lookout for what needs to be done and takes initiative to take care of things without having to be asked. Griselda has learned many special skills, strategies, and techniques to support our students' special needs and is always looking to learn more. She asks questions, listens for answers, and takes advantage of all learning opportunities. Griselda has said, I love being part of Leela because we are all a family. Griselda, we want you to know that you are equally loved by all of the students and staff. One of our classroom teachers shared that Griselda is just all around amazing. Our preschool program is very fortunate to have her on our team. It's my pleasure to recognize Griselda Sanchez as the Lewis Early Learning Academy Classified Employee of the Month. Peter Lunabus is our Certificated Employee of the Month. Mr. Peter, as he's known to everyone, has been a speech and language pathologist with Santa Rosa City Schools since August 2012. I've had the great pleasure of working side by side with Peter in the preschool program for all of these years. Peter loves many things about his job, but he has said that the most rewarding part is the relationships that he builds with his students and their families. These positive relationships are evident on a daily basis. Our students arrive at school and excitedly run to Mr. Peter to receive their speech and language services. I see their glee and listen to their laughter as the children joyfully learn to use words to communicate. I have the pleasure of receiving comments of great respect, admiration, and thanks that our students' families bestow upon Peter. These positive relationships are long lasting too. Children who learned from Peter years ago still stop by with their families to visit, communicate, and share their life successes with him. Peter is respected and admired by our staff too. One staff member shared that Peter's a hard worker and always offers his time to discuss students with their families and with colleagues. He is generous with his positivity. 
He has an admirable capacity for curiosity that helps focus on solutions. Peter's a terrific collaborator, innovative thinker, seeker of knowledge, and a thoughtful service provider. He spends countless hours figuring out the best way to reach each student, improve their communication skills, and prepare them for the most success when they move on to TK or kindergarten. Outside of work, Peter still gives of himself to parents, caregivers, and teachers who work with children zero to five years of age. He's also a talented musician and enjoys producing music and collaborating with musicians from around the world. He spends quality time with his family in California and in Chile, where he plans to retire someday, but not too soon. <laughs> it's an honor to recognize Peter Lunabis as the Lewis Early Learning Academy Certificated Employee of the Month. Good evening, Superintendent Trunell, distinguished members of the board, and Santa Rosa City Schools. My name is Michael Jablonski, and I am the proud principal of Albert F. Biela Elementary, and I'm here to recognize some exemplary people. Um, we have a big crew who's supporting us right now. Uh, that's the Biela Dedication, Loyalty, and Pride. Um, but I'd like to spotlight an incredible young woman who has given uh, a marvel of achievements to our school community. Roxy Griggs has been an exemplary member of our Biela community since kindergarten. She is an accomplished student, athlete, and musician. Roxy is an advanced student who is always questioning and seeking a deeper understanding of her schoolwork. She is thoughtful and kind and greets both students and staff with a warm smile every day. Roxy has been a competitive gymnast for as long as she can remember. She has proven to be pound for pound the strongest sixth grader at our school by outperforming everyone in pull-ups and in dips. She looks forward to joining the Bielis girls basketball team in the next few weeks, and she plays both the clarinet and the piano. She would like to learn how to play the bassoon. When she's not playing music, Roxy enjoys listening to music from the 80s. And in her free time, Roxy enjoys spending time with her two ferrets and her dog. Her love of animals has inspired her to open her own pet grooming business when she is older. She is a model of our school and we are proud to recognize her as our student of the year. So. Thank you so much. At Biela Elementary, some of the most helpful people work behind the scenes. You may not recognize her right away, but behind every field trip, every assembly or functioning Chromebook is Andrea De Farley. Andrea started her journey with Biela as a parent in 1994 when her three children began attending our school. 
Quick to get involved and support her community, Andrea volunteered in the kindergarten classes and discovered a joy for education. She was soon recruited to support the outside student safety and engagement as a yard duty team member, where she worked with the kids of all grade levels. In her own words, Biella, it feels like home. Andrea brings commitment and a deep-hearted drive to her work at Biella Elementary. Always eager to help, she's expanded her role and responsibilities to both a resource assistant and instructional materials technician. Throughout the years, Andrea has been an active participant in the school site council and our PTA. She is single-handedly responsible for bringing a Biella bingo night to our community and building camaraderie and fundraising to our families. For Andrea, it's not just work, it's family. Her father has helped support the ongoing developments of the field and the playground with his local business, and her grandson, currently Karen, carries the Blue Heron torch. While Andrea may not always be in the spotlight, her colleagues recognize the important work that she tirelessly dedicates to making our school a better place. It is with great appreciation that we honor Andrea with this distinguished award as our classified employee of the month. Andrea is a true testament to the power of family partnership and commitment in shaping a successful school. Over the past 33 years, Susan Fries has dedicated countless hours of commitment and joy to Albert F. Biela Elementary School. She has witnessed firsthand the evolution of our school community. When Biela Elementary opened in 1989, Susan was quick to join the team the following year. Always with a can-do attitude, Susan has taught kindergarten, first, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, serving our community with integrity and with pride. Susan currently teaches fourth grade and attributes her love for this level to their ongoing wonderment, curiosity, and autonomy. Throughout her career at Biella, Susan has supported our school site council, PTA, safety committee, and after school Spanish classes. Susan consistently reaches above and beyond to bring her enthusiasm to the Biella school community. Susan is a committed educator. Her colleagues recognize her tireless devotion to her ongoing professional learning and her growth. She is frequently at the forefront of investigating a new program or an initiative that supports student achievement. With a deep passion for supporting and championing our multilingual learners and their families, Susan has built a career on inclusivity. Susan has initiated the development and the implementation of Biela's Latino Literacy Program designing and teaching English classes to families and bringing ongoing traditions like our fiesta to the whole school. Susan loves our families and is proud to work at a neighborhood school that serves as a tenant in our community. Over the years, Susan has taught kids of former students and helped continue the legacy of Biella. Jessica Hernandez spoke highly of Ms. Fries. Susan is an amazing dedicated teacher that goes beyond not only for her school site, but for other teachers and students in our district. During the pandemic, we collaborated and exchanged ideas. We were also part of a collaborative group of teachers who were meeting weekly and learning about online software that would support our students during distance learning. I was always so impressed by her enthusiasm and willingness to learn new things because she knew that might benefit a student. As the migrant Ed Tosa now, I feel so blessed to work alongside her. When I have new things to try out or get honest feedback, I know I can turn to Mrs. Fries. To know Susan is an honor and a privilege because you gain so much from her. 
Susan exemplifies the core values of Biella, and we are proud to honor her with the distinction of Teacher of the Year. It is with great pride and gratitude that we share our excitement in presenting this professional milestone that solidifies a triumphant career in education. For Susan Fries, education isn't just an occupation, it is a calling. Buenas tardes a todos. Espérame. Mi nombre es Gracia Heredia, soy mamá de tres niños que asisten a la escuela Albert Piela y uno en Comstar. He asistido previamente a tres juntas de ILAC el año anterior y este año estamos empezando a organizar nuestro grupo de ILAC pequeño pero poderoso. Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Gracia Heredia. I am the mother of three children who attend Albert Biela School and another who attends Comstock. I have attended three ELAC meetings in the past year. And this year, we are starting to organize our small but mighty ELAC group. En nuestra primera junta, hablamos sobre los datos de nuestros estudiantes, aprendices de inglés, y cómo podemos mejorar o apoyar a nuestros padres para que ayuden a sus hijos a tener éxito académico. Para empezar, la participación de los padres es crucial y es el primer paso que debemos tomar. At our first meeting, we discussed data on our English learner students and how we can improve or support our parents in helping their children to be academically successful. To begin with, Parental involvement is crucial and is the first step we must take. Yo antes sentía que mi lenguaje era una barrera, pero he aprendido que no debe ser y no lo es, ya que recibimos apoyo por la escuela para comunicarnos y volvernos más participantes para el desarrollo académico. Yo he sido parte de nuestra comunidad en Biela desde el 2014. I used to feel that my language was a barrier, but I have learned that it should not, but it is not, since we received support from the school to communicate and become more involved in academic development. I have been a part of our community in Biela since 2014. Gracias, thank you. Thank you. And just uh, for everyone following on the agenda, uh, we've started item C8, school site parent organization updates. And that was Gracia Heredia, ELAC representative from Albert Biel Elementary School. Hello, good evening. Congratulations to everybody. My name is Anna Valle Hope, and I am just one of the ever so proud parents um, of current and one former Biela elementary student. Not only am I a fellow alumna of Biela, I'm also the current PTA treasurer. 
Yella has and will always hold a special place in my heart. From our amazing teachers, the faculty, um, to the wonderful community of families that we have at our site. As a student, I appreciated the level of quality of education I received at Biela, but now as a parent, I more than ever appreciate the level of dedication and commitment the faculty and staff have shown to our students over the years, which is partly why I became a PTA member, to be more involved with my children's education and assist with fun activities. Our PTA is a proud group of committed parents, family members, staff, and faculty. We recently began holding our association meetings in person in efforts to build up our school community. Our PTA is a multicultural association and all are welcome. We all work together with a common goal to create a positive place for our children. PTA has supported whole school events like our walkathon, um, our school fiesta, our basketball teams, and various book and various book fairs. Now that we seem to be more flexible to hold in-person gatherings, I can't wait to bring back movie nights, junk food bingo, and all the other fun events that we have previously held. Currently, we are excited to begin offering new merchandise that reflects our pride and joy of Biela. I never thought I'd be PTA mom. It was never my peripheral ever. I never thought that it was something that I would fit into, but now I being part of a really, really great team, I don't think I could ever not be part of PTA. If not a treasure, at least be there. Um, I couldn't find a better group of people to work with, and I cannot wait to see what else we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Before we move on to um, public comment, we're just going to take uh, one minute in case there are folks who want to transition um, with the rest of their evening. You are welcome to do so, or you're welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting. Bye, Suzanne. I think we can continue on at this time to item C9, public comment. On non-agenda items, we are now opening this up for members of the public to speak to the board on non-agenda non items only. Speakers are limited to three minutes each. I do not see any blue cards for individuals in the chamber, so we will move to remote attendees at this time. Thank you, President Manieri. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on non-agenda items. Please raise your hand at this time. Our first speaker is Adina Flores. And there'll be a three minute uh, timer that you can follow. Uh, good evening. I'd like to know what's being done to create equity within the County of Sonoma Equity Office, being that Director De La Cruz heads that department. Over a hundred individuals have come forward to me in the past week, the past seven days regarding extortion by the County of Sonoma's Code Enforcement and Permitting Department. Latinos and the elderly are being primarily targeted. So I'm wondering why there's been zero disciplinary action taken to address the employees who are violating the law. Supervisor James Gore appointed his own brother-in-law, Jake McKee, to the Fish and Wildlife Commission to oversee cannabis enforcement. The Gore family owns vineyards and cannabis grows in both Mendo and Sonoma County. Mr. McKee also founded Wayfinder LLC, which is a land usage and permitting firm that is heavily focused on the cannabis industry. Mr. McKee omitted this source of income from his Form 700 
and he and Supervisor Gore are currently under investigation with the Fair Political Practices Commission for this matter. Only 1% of cannabis applicants are currently being approved for permitting in Mendocino. Ms. Babini is the head of planning for cannabis within the county of Mendo and also the project manager to Wayfinder LLC, Mr. McKee's Corporation. Mr. Fitzsimmons is another planner within the county of Mendo who is also a consultant for Wayfinder. Ms. Kelly Abudara, the Santa Rosa Code Enforcement Manager, was recently arrested for extortion, yet the Google search engine was scrubbed and the media refuses to cover the story. The DA and sheriff's offices are refusing to take any complaints on this matter as well. I thought I was the only one being berated and harassed by the county, but apparently this is happening all over. I'm just curious what's being done in the name of equity. Am I able to send the individuals being harassed to the equity office for help, or should I let them know that government tyranny and extortion is legal? within the county of Sonoma and they are now SOL. Um, I just find it interesting because I'm completely right about this and I have six open cases. And so I was right about everything with COVID too. There are hundreds of illegalities within the county. So I'm just wondering why I was pushed out for speaking up about money being embezzled and extortion. Apparently I'm not the only one and this has nothing to do with COVID and I'm right. So I just love some answers and I'd love to know, I, I'm not a public servant at this point where I can send these people because in my free time daily, I am helping people who are being extorted by those that are supposed to represent us. So please let me know where I should send them. Thank you. Thank you. President Manieri, there are no other hands raised. Thank you. Oh, yes, I am on. Great, thank you. So at this oh. time, oh, sorry. Okay, at this time, um, we will move on to Item, oh, item C10, adoption of revised 2023 board meeting calendar. The board will consider adoption of the revised 2023 board meeting calendar as stated in board bylaw 9100 and 9322. And I will pass this on to Superintendent Trinnell. President Manieri, members of the board, those who are with us in person and online, per action that the board took at our last board meeting um, to remove July as a regular board meeting set of date or dates. Um, you will see the revised board meeting calendar reflecting that there will be no meetings in July. And I hand it back to you for the board's consideration tonight. Thank you. And just for clarification, is this an action item? Okay, so we are seeking a motion on this item. Do we need to take public comment on this item? Okay. So we're just looking for a motion on this item. I move to approve adoption of the revised 2023 board meeting calendar. I second. second. I was moved by Director Fong and seconded by Director Sheffield. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. And now we are in our report items. And first we have our California School Employee CSEA Santa Rosa 75 report. Um, is CSEA President Mary Lehman present? There will be no report tonight from CSEA 75. Thank you. And now we have Santa Rosa Teachers Association report with uh, SRTA President Catherine Howell. Good evening, uh, President Manieri, Superintendent Trinnell, members of the board, uh, everyone watching on Zoom and in the room. I'm Catherine Howell, SRTA president, representing about 850 teachers in Santa Rosa City Schools. Um, I want to start tonight saying thank you for the initial salary placement guidelines that this board has changed uh, recently over the past couple of months our members are gonna get uh, their new placements and their increased salaries uh, on the 28th. So that's very exciting um, for many of our members who are now finding equity for the first time since 2019. Um, at the risk of sounding ungrateful and saying, oh, but one more thing, um, that particular document, which is not a negotiable document by SRTA, 
can only be changed at board direction. And um, what has come up is there are classified people, classified members uh, in at Santa Rosa City Schools who are becoming qualified to be certificated teachers. Um, and finding that becoming a first year teacher, they would ask actually be earning less money than they are depending on their placement in the CSEA salary schedule. So it would be great to support our CSEA brothers and sisters and give them some credit for the work they've done already for Santa Rosa City Schools if they choose to transition into the certificated categories and help with our great teacher shortage. So I'm bringing that up because we can't negotiate it, but we would if we could. Um, but we do want to say thank you very much for the work you've already done uh, at risk of sounding ungrateful about that. I also want to tell you uh, that last week uh, we had a really good meeting with some people from special services. It was facilitated by Director Vicki Zanz about our co-teachers, which are gen ed teachers and special ed teachers working together to create learning environments for um, students with IEPs. It's fairly new to our district. We're still working out a lot of the problems. Um, and this meeting is part of that. And we found out a lot of really good things. Teachers that are in really good co-teaching partnerships all agreed that it, it does seem to be better for the students for the most part uh, to give them two adults in the room, two teachers that are working together more one-on-one -on -one time for the students, a little bit more focus for them. Um, but we are being faced in our co-teaching program with the same program problems that we have elsewhere, which is not enough teachers, uh, ratios that are extremely high. Uh, our current co-teaching parameters say that in a, a mix, a co-taught class, there should be no more than about a third of the students with IEPs. And right now we're looking at classrooms that have 40 or 50% are students with IEPs, which kind of defeats the purpose of a, a mixed group of students. Um, so that's something we're going to be talking about. Our meetings are going to continue. We created some, some committee work, some committees that were generated by the work we did last Thursday. Um, people are really enthused about it. And I just wanted to let the board know about the work that we're doing, hopefully the, to make the co-teaching a little more cohesive, a little more understandable across the district and also a little more successful for all of the students that are involved in the co-teaching model, um, the students with IEPs, as well as the students in their gen ed classes, as this becomes more of the norm rather than the exception. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know what was going on with that. So thank you. Thank you, President Howell. Next, we have item D3, the superintendent report sake of time, thank you, President Manieri, members of the board, those in person and online. I will be very brief tonight, keeping with my tradition now of the number of days of school. Um, today marks day 118 of the 22-23 school year for elementary and day 117 for secondary. Um, I just want to remind our families and our community that this coming Monday is a school day since we've had back-to-back three-day weekends. Sorry about that. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Um, and item D4 is the board president report. Um, I, I do wanna share one thing, but I would like to start with a correction um, in item, the report of um, actions taken in closed session, item C3 um, for the four resolutions that the board approved. I stated that the board voted five to zero, but that is incorrect. The board voted seven to zero on all four of these resolutions. That was my mistake. So we just need to correct, make seven to zero. Yes. So we just need to re, uh, re, re, have the record reflect that the board voted seven to zero. Thank you. Um, and the, the one thing I wanted to mention or uh, share and during my report, is that on Saturday, I, I spoke to a group of students from the Bridge to the Future program that I just learned about. Um, 
And one of the volunteers is actually my, uh, my former middle school principal, Ms. Harriet Gray. Um, it was really great to see her. And so I spoke to students in this program, all uh, young people, some of our own uh, high school students. And I talked to them about my role as a, as a board member, um, as, as a school board president, and it was a really great time. It was the best part of my week. So just, I wanted to, to share that there's a really great program called Bridge to the Future. If anyone uh, wants to learn more about that, they have a lot of information online. And I will move on to item D5, board member reports. Are there any board member reports? Director Fong. I got to visit Steel Lane uh, Elementary last week and they'd had their peace poll. I think it's almost the last peace poll that we've gotten on all our campuses have peace polls now. Incredible. Um, Principal um, Amber Williams did a good job with them. Thank you to the Rotary and Veterans for Peace. Also, that school is lovely inside. It's vibrant. It's warm. Everyone's engaged in lots of learning and lots of teaching. It was a great environment. So I thank uh, that school. Thank the principal. Thank the school. Thank you. Any other board member reports? Okay, moving on to item D6. Uh, do we have a CSBA report this evening? Director Fung? Just to highlight, CSBA, California School Board Association, is working very hard to work with the legislature to fully fund the local control of funding formula cost of living adjustment and keep it from being cut. They're working, you know, pretty much nonstop lobbying and they're trying not to cut the arts music and instructional materials discretionary block grant, which they're threatening to take the money out of that. So we really, we're backing CSBA. CSBA is backing, keeping the arts money. They've already given it to us, but they're, now they're gonna take it back and uh, to fully fund the LCFF cost of living. So behind the scenes, lots of it, you're gonna hear more about it. Thank you. Very important work, thank you. This brings us to our E items, our discussion and action items for today's meeting. E1 is an action item, resolution celebrating March as Women's History Month. Uh, the board will consider approval of resolution 2022-2349, recognizing March 2023 as National Women's History Month, month and presenting this action item is Associate Superintendent Cavan. Thank you, President Manieri. Thank you, the board and Santa Rosa City Schools community. I would like to share that I am honored to be able to ask the board to um, recognize March as National Women's History Month. I'm very honored in that I am the first uh, female chief business official for Santa Rosa City Schools, aside from temporary contract. So thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity. I did find that this is um, pretty interesting that Women's History Month uh, began as a local celebration right here in Santa Rosa by the Education Task Force of Sonoma County uh, Commission on the Status of Women, which implemented a Women's History Week celebration in 1978. So I thought that was just a really great um, introduction in that first paragraph of the resolution. Thank you. Um, this is an action item. Are there any board member questions? Okay, and uh, at this moment, we'll go to public comment. Are, is there anyone online who would like to give public comment on this item? If there are members of the public joining us online and would like to comment on item E1, please raise your hand at this time. President Manieri, there are no hands raised. Okay, so this is um, coming back to the board for further questions, discussion, or a motion. Um, at first, is, is there any discussion on the motion before we move to a motion? Okay, Superintendent Trinnell, would you like to say something? Yes, I just want to, I wanted to reiterate um, the history that we are making by having our very first CBO, um, who is a phenomenal woman that I am getting to know and work with. And I have to share a quick story um, on that end and I might get emotional. So on the night that the board approved um, the hire of Ms. Cavan, uh, Ms. Cavan was in the Plumas uh, School District and they were having their board meeting on that very same night. And the board meeting was actually at the high school where I graduated from high school. And she was in the library where I graduated from high school. 
And it was a full universe circle moment for me to be a sitting superintendent with a reflection that there is no way that I would have thought that that girl at that high school would have been a superintendent one day. So um, I'm just honored to have you on our team and honored to have you present this tonight. Thank you, Thank you Lisa, <laughs> for all you do for the district. Um, are there any other uh, discussion, is there any other discussion that this board would like to have? Right, so then we're looking for a motion on this item. I'd like to move to approve the resolution recognizing March 2023 as National Women's History Month. Second. That was moved by Director de la Cruz and seconded by Director Fong. Full call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director de la Cruz. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Viva la mujer. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. That motion passes. Thank you. Item E2 is also an action item. Resolution recognizing March as Arts Education Month. The board will consider approval of resolution number 2022-2350, declaring March as Arts Education Month in Santa Rosa City Schools and presenting this action item. Um, I don't see Dr. Castro, so I'm assuming it's just Mr. Olson. Oh, he's online. Great, so it's Dr. Castro and Eric Olson. Good evening. Good evening, President Manieri, Superintendent Trinnell, members of the board, staff, and members of the Santa Rosa City Schools community. Uh, to read tonight's uh, resolution into the record and the requested action, I'd like to welcome our uh, TOSA for Visual and Performing Arts, Eric Olson. Good evening, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Trinnell, and uh, all else who are here. Um, so the consideration, uh, California Arts Education Month celebrates arts education, which includes dance, music, theater, media, and visual arts. These experiences encourage creative learning in children and young adults. We recognize a well-rounded education includes the stimulation and creative thinking that the arts help to develop. It is important that we recognize and celebrate the essential role of arts education in our schools and Arts Education Month helps communicate that intrinsic value. Some examples of the way that Santa Rosa City Schools supports our education include applying for and receiving a second grant, which will allow us release time for Santa Rosa City School staff to work with community members and form an arts planning committee, which we hope will adapt our visual and performing arts framework into a strategic arts plan. Expanding our district-wide honor ensemble concerts to now include middle school and high school music uh, representatives, as well as our elementary and middle school groups all mixed together in two concerts, April 26th and 27th at Pioneer High School, um, and in past years, applying for and receiving a $1.48 million grant to expand the Elementary Music Blitz program back in 2018, 2019, which was used to purchase over 1,500 brand new wind string instruments for our students, as well as set up music classes for every fourth, fifth, and sixth grader in all of our nine traditional elementary schools. I had the pleasure of doing that earlier today. It's a lot of fun. And finally, an ongoing partnership with Luther Burbank Center to provide Mariachi Arts uh, Summer Camp, which we've been doing since summer 2013. Thank you. This is an action item. Are there any board member questions? We will move on to public comment. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E2. Please raise your hand at this time. Our first speaker is Margaret Boone. Good evening. Um, I wanted to say I'm excited that we're recognizing the value of the arts. I struggled with my social emotional health in high school due to anxiety, selective mutism, and family issues at home. It greatly impacted my attendance and as a result, my grades. The one thing that kept me interested in school was having the opportunity to take a wide variety of art classes, drawing, photography, computer animation, commercial art, and more so that every year I had art classes. I don't think we can undervalue the importance of the arts. The visual arts are also one of the most accessible subjects for many of our students in special ed. I hope we continue to see our arts programs grow throughout all of our schools moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. President Manieri, there are no other hands raised. 
Thank you. Bringing in this back to the board for any further questions, discussion, or a motion. Director Medina. To approve the resolution recognizing March as Arts Education Month. I'll second. Second. I heard a motion from Director De La Cruz and a second from Director Sheffield, but Director Medina, you also had your hand up. I was going to move. Okay. <laughs> so that was a motion by Director De La Cruz and a second by Director Sheffield. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. And now we have item E3. This is also an action item. Approval of Quatrachi. But someone can correct me on the pronunciation of that. Quack Architects as the architect firm to develop the facilities master plan. Um, and I will hand this over to our associate superintendent, Kevin. Thank you. It'll be just a moment for us to get the presentation. While we're waiting for that, thank you again, President Manieri, members of the board, Superintendent Trinnell, and Santa Rosa City Schools community. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up. Hopefully we have better luck this time than the last time I tried to share my screen. Right. There we go. So just a quick presentation this evening on what a facilities master plan is, kind of what the process is, where we are, and why it's important. Uh, so really it provides us with kind of our roadmap, an overview of everything that needs to happen district-wide. It's in a way a vision and wish list. It's a big picture. It does not mean that everything that's in the master plan will be able to be accomplished with one set of funding, as we know, back in 2015, we are now just continuing the work that we did then, updated with the new information and additional funding and what's happened between then and now. So again, overview of the quality of our existing facilities, and it helps us determine also what, what additional funding sources are needed in the future in addition to our bonds or what things we can use to augment. So some ways that we can fund a facilities master plan are through voter approved debt, so bonds, uh, state matching funds, reimbursements for modernization or hardship if we end up running into um, you know, any hazards as we're going through these facilities that require any type of emergency work. And that's done on a cost share basis. The percentage depends on the type of um, issues that we run into, the type of reimbursements we're able to qualify for. Grants, those sometimes happen through, say, CTE or other programs that become available. Our developer fees, so depending on um, if we have a schools that are growing or what that looks like, we may have an opportunity to provide some improved facilities there. You can also do negotiating negotiated fees with developers, such as Melarus. Right now, we don't have any of that. Doesn't necessarily mean that that wouldn't be something in the future. And there's always the last choice for my in my opinion which is which are certificates of participation and those are actually uh, essentially a loan that's repaid through the general fund typically you wouldn't want to do that because it does impact your operating costs that are available and so just a history in 2014 uh, Santa Rosa City uh, voters voted for measures I and L and you know, have shown great support for the schools over that period of time. 2015, we created the facilities master plan, which identified over a billion dollars in need, which was not, you know, that far exceeded the bonds that were approved at that time. We still have a huge amount of need, I believe still over that amount. Uh, then, obviously, we did an update last fall to the facilities master plan, and the voters continued to have faith in Santa Rosa City Schools and prioritize education and passed measures C and G. And now we're going to be going out and developing a new facilities master plan as an update to the work that's already happened. We did send it, put out an RFP, which is a request for proposals, and that went out in December. Uh, it's had seven firms respond at the end of January. 
Uh, we then conducted interviews with a wide panel and uh, we came to a recommendation that we would like to um, recommend QKA local architect to help us with that plan. Uh, one of the things that we will start with once uh, the board hopefully approves us moving forward with that would be community outreach. And so that would begin likely March and April. Um, we really wanna make sure that we have community input before the schools are released for the summer. That then gives us a lot of time over the summer to work with QKA. And then the, you know, there'll be refinements and, and that that happen with the plan. We come back to the board in November for official approval um, or recommendation of approval for the final plan. Um, I kind of talked through here as we went along, but uh, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we had some great firms respond. It was a very competitive pool. Um, so we're, we're very pleased with that. And we're very pleased that we were able to select QKA. It's the recommendation with our local firm. They know our facilities well. They're very responsive and have been um, great partners thus far. Are there any questions from the board? I have a question. Well, did, uh, sorry, Director Flores and then Director Fong, Director Sheffield and Vice President Medina. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, I remember when we were looking at um, doing our measures, right, our fund measures, uh, one of the, uh, questions we asked was, you know, we, we spent $500,000 last time, you know, developing the uh, master plan, right? And then uh, we were informed here that the master plan just needed to be updated, right? This to me sounds like a brand new master plan uh, costing us, you know, three hundred dollars to $4,000, right? Thereabouts. So I'm just a little bit confused because, you know, when I asked for clarifying questions about, you know, the expenditures, right? I wasn't expecting a three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar, you know, bill for an update on the master plan from you know the previous bonds. So, um, would you like to update us as to why it's different now from what you told us before uh, during the presentation, where we were informed that it was just going to be an update and some tweaks were going to be made from the original master plan to this one? Okay. Thank you. So I, you know, I, I can say I wasn't part of the discussion in the fall, so I'm sorry, I can't speak to that in particular. What I can share is that when we're going out in the process with this, is that we wanted to make sure that we um, were getting community input because a lot of things have changed in the last six years. The input that was received in 2000, oh, I guess it's been longer than six years now when we look at 2015, 16, and we're into 23. There have been a lot of changes in that time and a lot of work has been done. Things have also changed as far as our enrollment and the prioritization as far as other community at schools have, have likely changed in that period of time. It is something that we did hear a lot of input about and continue to hear is that we have requests for transparency and participation in the process. And so that has been um, a, a large um, bit of feedback that we've been receiving. I'll defer to Superintendent Trinnell. Cabin didn't start with us until November, and we had brought forward those processes previously. So what I can speak to in that process is um, just helping everyone understand that the current facilities master plan that we have was written through the lens of um, bond measures I and L. When the company brought forward the updates showing what had bless you, what had already been accomplished and the things that were sort of still with, uh, encompassed within the plan, um, we have to think about what we also shared with our voters for bond measures C um, and G. So in that, we will have to do work which will involve multiple community sessions. For INL, I think we had over 70 of those, um, and that was specific through the lens of I and L. So we will need to, I don't know if it will be to that extent, which is why there is a smaller dollar amount. Mind you, it is still a high amount, um, relatively speaking, but we will need to look through the lens of C and G and also take into account what we already know about our current facilities master plan with reprioritization um, because of new things that might be coming into play 
um, with our student population, the conditions of our current um, schools, et cetera. So it's not to the extent, and I can't speak to what, what took the two years, right, to make the first INL, but this is a very expedited process. So we're not taking two years to make this uh, measure C and G facilities master plan. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess my, my point is that, you know, we, we do ask these clarifying questions uh, a while back. And um, I just want to make sure that when uh, that we are given, you know, the right information back then and then, um, because this doesn't look like a tweak. Um, it, it looks like a, a major update. I mean, which I am completely fine because it's a different measure and it, we should have this, right? But when we ask these sort of questions, I just want to make sure that we're given that information right there and then when we ask that. So um, just because when I saw this, I was like, wait, this is a quite a large amount for another master plan that we paid, you know, you know, half a million dollars for a while back. So um, just, you know, just be cognizant of that. And, and I get it, you know, construction is expensive, uh, but I just wanna make sure that when we ask those questions that they're asked, that, that they answer fully to the extent of your knowledge then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Fong. Thanks for that uh, comment. Director Flores, but I can see where it's eight years later, we have done a lot of work. We're in a different educational time period and it does take another look and we are asking for a lot more input. So I, I can see your point though. Um, thank you, um, Assistant Superintendent Kevin. Who was QKA our, our uh, firm from before 2015? Yes, it was. So they do already have a lot of knowledge. It will actually, um, that's, they were a little bit lower in cost than some of the others. And I would say part of that is because they already have quite a bit of knowledge about our facilities. And, you know, they just did an, a little bit of an update back in the fall. So they do, um, they do have those relationships and are intimately familiar with our buildings and needs. So to our board, as part of that in 2015 and 2016, they did a really great job in, in reaching out to the schools and, and our stakeholders in the schools. So I appreciated that. I'm just gonna give you a little preview of what I really will be hammering when they come to us is that um, yes, roofs and yes, safety and yes, all that stuff. But yes, I really wanna take a look at our facilities in terms of how we accommodate good learning and good teaching. And we don't do it in um, some of the confined spaces that we have today for our educational purposes. Anywhere from like outdoor areas to play areas to um, classroom areas, uh, learning areas for kids. So as we continue to change our buildings, one of the overarching considerations for me as an educator and as a board member is that we design spaces for teaching and learning. And right now they're not really designed for teaching and learning. They're designed to keep kids in place, in my opinion. But thank you. Thank you. And thank you to QKA coming up. Thank you, Director Fong. Director Sheffield. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Associate Superintendent Gavin. I, I, you, you talked a little bit about, and it was just brought up, um, some of the considerations. I'm wondering if you can, and maybe for mostly for the public, the spirit of transparency, can you take us through some of the considerations in the narrowing down and final selection process? And we have good history with them. Um, they're local. Um, can you share with us, yeah, how that process was? Yes, absolutely. One thing that, um, so there were several things that you know, made QKA stand out. We had a variety of firms, some that were extremely large, some that were had a presence internationally, nationally, all throughout California, and others that, well, they each had a, a somewhat local base, so somewhere in the Bay Area or Sacramento were their you know, headquarters for, for the closeness. Something that was really key is that QKA, because of that relationship and their proximity, they're very responsive. We typically get a same-day response when we reach out to them with a question or, or a need. Uh, they also brought King Consulting with them as part of their presentation team. King Consulting is who we're working with um, already with our um, modernization, with our, our funding applications. And they brought them in as a partner for the demographer 
um, portion of it, uh, which is really you know key that to be able to to pay attention to what we have, those relationships that we already have in place and build upon them and really expand that working team. So I would say that was another large piece of it. And then again, the, the local aspect and, and just the familiarity that, that they have with our facilities and their connections that every one of their presenters had to Santa Rosa City Schools. And I, I noticed there was a lot of information in the packet about who know who was part of the deciding um, I appreciate that information as well I think the public does um, and you know as we move forward with these types of contract awards bidding process um, the more information that's available for the public um, and the more information that's given to us so we are confident comfortable when we speak um, to our constituents thank you so much thank you vice president Medina Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I have a few questions. Um, the first is in terms of uh, current and future needs, like uh, is there like a outline as to how far in the future the needs are looked into, into and um, in the process uh, within the, the, the master plan, is there a prioritization, like what's essential, what's long-term? And in terms of, of future needs, I'm really thinking also like technological, whether it be like energy, you know, internet, all that stuff. Absolutely, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, typically a facilities master plan is expected to cover about 10 years. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, that's the number, that's just the projection that it would identify needs for the next 10 years. So with that, you try to take a look at what the technology needs may be, what upgrades may be needed, what, you know, what um, is available now versus what they think may be coming out. So it's really a, this wouldn't be the plan. This is an estimate. It's an idea. It's the, uh, what, what would the community like to see? What would the, you know, the stakeholders, the board ultimately you know, makes the decision of yes, this is where we want to go or no, we don't. Um, prioritization it doesn't necessarily happen within the facilities master plan. Needs are identified and then the priorities are shared with the board, but essentially the board officially sets those priorities and, and agrees. There would be, of course, the, these are the things that are very necessary to happen versus here's what's nice and these are the really if we if we have money left or if you know there's another way for us to augment you know you, you do typically see that type of um, information in there so you'll have sometimes a base model versus a better so you'll have a range of estimates so it kind of depends uh, second question is in relation to the community outreach i think i saw in their present in their proposal 400 to 500 hours I'm curious as to kind of what that looks like, a certain amount of hours like for school, what are the different environments? And also, does that include like, um, uh, well, not, not bilingual, but also like uh, outreach events that are just in Spanish, for example, because that's a large part of our population. So we will actually be developing what that plan looks like um, with QKA if the, if the board approves our recommendation for, for them as, as the selected firm, we would be coming out with that. So we would love to, if there are particular events that you would like us to focus on, but definitely we wanna reach out to our bilingual population. We wanna make sure that we're getting input at each of our facilities and you know having multiple um, venues, whether it's hybrid or in-person Zoom meetings, you know, internet, what, whatever that may be that we get that feedback. We do have a, a compressed timeline, but we wanna make sure that we are getting the most bang for our buck with that timeline out there and really hitting that, the advertisement for the community input. Community includes students and families and, and staff. You know, it's, it's not just limited to, you know, the, the people who are on site. It's, people in the area, you know, our schools affect property values. There are all kinds of, of things that, that are impacted by that. So the wider net we can cast, the better. And in, in your 
presentation under the funding options. Mm -hmm. You know, I missed this. I'm not sure. Was were the the first four bold ones? Were those the only ones? Or I, I was just curious about negotiated fees. Mello Ruse is that. Mm -hmm. Are, are we a Miller Rouge district or is, are we considered? So, so the first four I'm familiar with and have and have experience with, and I would say that these we already use, we already utilize in one form or another, or have utilized in one form or another. Negotiated fees with Miller Rouge, what that would be is if there's a developer who's going to put in a, say, a planned community, there's, if there's going to be an impact on a school in that area, you can negotiate fees with that contractor to improve the school and provide how you know additional seats in that class and in classes in those schools if necessary. There's more information that would need to be done, you know, more research that would need to be done to determine if that would be a fit for us. So the bolded items are those that we know are a fit for our district. The other two are things that are possibilities. It doesn't mean that those would be things that we would pursue. That would depend on the direction of the board, on the possibilities of you know, expansion you know, with, with development or, or not. And again, the certificates of participation, typically we wouldn't want to recommend those unless there were something um, we expected to see a large boom of you know, a large influx and had an immediate facility need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any board member questions? Director of the Nicholas. One of the questions that's come up recently in our community is um, how we can make sure that our school facilities are also enjoyed safely by our, the communities who live around them. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that's gonna be part of kind of this overarching facilities master plan and how we intend to um, engage folks around, you know, the ways in which our schools are also community um, benefits, right? Um, so, and then each community is, you know, in many ways kind of different about how, um, whether schools are open or closed and whether or not kids can play in the playground after school. And, um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, um, a little about uh, QK's equity lens and how they might have experience in addressing some of these issues across a district that is as diverse in terms of the ways in which our schools and our, and our communities um, are made up and, and exist around our school facilities. Thank you. And I would say that that's really something that we drive that while QKA definitely, you know, they, we asked that each of the firms include equity information in their proposals and they, they each gave some sort of presentation, something related to that in their presentation, but really it's dependent on what we as the district want to see from them from that lens. And so, you know, input from the community is, is huge. And again, we wanna cast as wide of a net as we can for that input. We wanna have a very transparent process where there is that, you know, that give and take and, and, and open dialogue um, opportunity, you know, that opportunity for dialogue whenever possible. So community um, use is, is definitely, you know, schools are, are the hub in our, com in our communities. And so when we have an opportunity to partner, that's fantastic. I, I would also um, want to call, um, you know, just to the forefront that we do have the Civic Center Use Act. So we do have public facilities. They are available for public use. And there is a process um, that's that's set on that, whether it's somebody just, you know, using it to, you know, walk the track individually versus um, an organization using it who's potentially collecting, you know, fees, in which case then with it being a public space, we have an obligation to then collect fees to help defray those costs for maintenance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, at this time, we will move on to, on to public comment. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E3. Please raise your hand at this time. Our first speaker is Stephen Kwok. Good evening, um, President Minieri, 
members of the board, Superintendent Trinnell, it's a real honor and pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to be before you, even though it's by Zoom, um, be before you to have us considered as your uh, facility master plan architects. We're honored and pleased to be able to continue the work that you guys have been talking about started back in 2015. And, um, you know, it was it was great work back then. We did a lot of work identifying needs across the, the, the district and began the process of identifying how we address those needs. And so are, are looking forward to continuing that work and to continue to work with you all as well, everyone in the district. Uh, I've really appreciated the conversation that you guys have been having this evening. Those are really good questions. Those are good things to ask. And just as we go forward and, and go through the process, should you approve us, I would welcome you to continue to ask those questions of us. We're more than happy to come and talk about any of these issues uh, that were brought up this evening. So just want to keep it brief and again, say thank you. We appreciate this opportunity and look forward to it. Thank you. President Manny Manieri, there are no other hands raised. Okay, so bringing this back to the board for any further questions, discussion, or a motion. Director Flores. Um, thank you, President Manieri. Um, I'd just like to see, um, you know, a little bit, something a little bit different uh, in, in, in the next phases of the implementation of what we're doing in terms of construction. construction. Uh, not only, you know, updates on our website, uh, but uh, communications uh, via Parent Square, uh, what, you know, what your tax dollars are doing, you know, uh, in this month quarterly or whatnot. Um, I know I received those as a board member, right? And they were pretty informative. And I think it's also important for our uh, um, citizens to, to, and parents and students to, to hear and, and, and know what's going on quarterly, I think monthly will be a little bit too much, but quarterly, you know, to, to, to inform um, what we're up to um, and, you know, with the uh, bond uh, funds. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Director Fong. Approval of Cotrachi Kwok Architects as the architect firm to develop the facilities master plan for 2023. I'll second. I was moved by Director Fong and seconded by Director Sheffield. Is there any other discussion before we call for a roll call vote? Director or Vice President Medina. Yeah, I would just like to uh, offer a friendly amendment to that and adding that we allocate up to $420,750 for that contract. Remind me what the you would accept or what is the limit right now? That's it. That is the accept. I believe you also must accept. I, I just have a, a further question with that. I'm just wondering what I'm trying to foresee and can we foresee any future ramifications to um, setting uh, an absolute dollar amount? Is that something? That was their proposed range. Okay. That was the high the end. High, of, high yes, end of the that range. was the high end of the range, depending on the number of community, you know, sessions sure. and the amount of. Okay, so I'm I'm wondering, day. can we imagine? And it predates you, I guess it predates you, but I'm wondering, are there circumstances? Do we have history in the past where we have not m met that, or for unforeseen reason? We go over that amount. I just, I don't know if that's a common, a common thing or not. I know it is when we get into the construction side of right. things, but. So my experience in my prior districts with facility master plan is that they stayed within the they range. They stayed within the range. Yes. Perfect. If there were to be a stray from that, it would be because we've asked for additional work or input, and additional that would come back to the sessions, board. and that would come back to the Perfect. board. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You, uh, do you accept uh, Vice President Medina's amendment? I think the, the kind of legal language in contract approvals is not to exceed. So it's a not to exceed amount, not kind of up to. So just to be a pain in the butt lawyer tonight. Yeah. 
Not to exceed, yeah. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director McNally. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. And, and could I just ask that we make sure that in the in the minutes it reflects the not to exceed language on the motion? Yes. Thank you. Item E4, this is a discussion item exploring the feasibility of a parcel tax. tax. Uh, the board will consider approval of TBWBH strategies to provide parcel tax feasibility consulting for a possible ballot measure. And presenting this discussion, discussion item are Superintendent Trinnell, Associate Superintendent Kevin, and Charles Heath. You, President Manieri, members of the board, those who are in person and online, um, per the request of the board, we are bringing this item for discussion tonight in order to explore the possibility of a future parcel tax. Um, thank you to Charles Heath for joining us. We are going to, going to get into a presentation which will include some of our prior history um, with this board in uh, exploration of that. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Lisa and to Charles. Thank you. And I will actually just hand it off to Charles. I'm going to go ahead and operate the uh, slideshow as we go along here. Okay, that sounds great. Good evening. Uh, I'm Charles Heath. I know most of you. I was served as the uh, consultant to your recent Measure CNG bond effort. Uh, my firm also did similar work for the district um, for the Measures INL bonds back in uh, 2014. And uh, what we're going to talk a little bit tonight uh, about is um, parcel taxes generally, but I'm also going to refresh the board's memory about some work we did on a potential parcel tax back in 2018 that I think provides some good foundational information as you might think about a uh, future measure. Um, so just in terms of the basics for, for a parcel tax, um, we're talking about parcels of land. We aren't talking about Amazon parcels or UPS parcels. Um, this is a property tax. Um, and uh, you know, school districts have basically two types of locally controlled revenue that you can put before the voters um, to support your, your schools. First is what we had with Measure C and G, uh, general obligation bond measure can be passed at 55% uh, support. Uh, however, the funds are strictly limited to facility improvements, furnishings, equipment, and technology, right? So it doesn't help you address programmatic and staffing needs. So the only option available to you to generate flexible uh, funding to address programmatic needs, academic programs, um, staffing needs, things of that nature, is with a parcel tax. Um, only about 9% of school districts in California have a parcel tax. They're pretty rare, uh, and that's because they're tough to pass. They require a two-thirds vote. So um, just getting into some of the technicalities of a parcel tax, uh, there's a couple different ways you can structure it. You can structure it on a simple per parcel basis. So all parcels in your district would pay the same amount. Um, that can be $50 per parcel, $100 per parcel. Um, there are some districts that have uh, very large parcel taxes. Piedmont Unified in the East Bay has a $2,500 per parcel tax. Uh, so they, they can get quite significant. Um, you can also structure the uh, tax based on the square footage of property. Thus, if you have larger properties, you know, bigger commercial and industrial properties, for example, they would pay more than smaller single family or multifamily residences. Um, so there's some options and different strategies you can consider there. California law does require that parcel taxes be applied uniformly across all parcels. So you cannot have a rate for residential properties and then a different rate for commercial. Um, the square footage methodology works because it's one tax rate that's applied uniformly, but that's really your only option if you wanna have that variability um, so that different uh, properties are paying different amounts. Um, the law also allows you to offer uh, three different types of exemptions. You can offer an exemption to senior citizens. Typically, it's over the age of homeowners over the age of 65 for their principal resident. And then you can also uh, exempt low-income people with disabilities that qualify for specific federal benefits. Um, as I mentioned, the funds are fully flexible. They can be used for any purpose. Um, that's really the benefit of a parcel tax is it's locally controlled dollars that you uh, can use for your specific needs. Um, typically, parcel taxes have a uh, duration, a set duration on them. Um, oftentimes, when parcel taxes are first passed, that duration is relatively short because you're trying to show the community that you're using the dollars to get benefit. And then they, once they see that, they'll approve it. 
There are some school districts in California that have uh, essentially permanent parcel taxes that will go on and, unless they're repealed by local voters. Um, typically, that's a pretty aggressive ask when you're trying to establish a parcel tax in the first place. Um, like your bond measures, you can also include accountability protections, independent citizens oversight committee, manual uh, mandatory audits, you know, those kinds of accountability protections, but they're optional for a parcel tax, whereas they're required for a bond measure. Um, you also have flexibility for when you might put a parcel tax on the ballot. You can take advantage of the regularly scheduled primary and general elections in the even numbered years, but you can also place parcel taxes on uh, special election ballots. And we'll, we'll uh, talk through some of those opportunities for upcoming elections. Um, one of the keys to success in a parcel tax is setting the right tax rate. So bond measures, you're asking voters to approve, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. And it's a little obscure exactly what that costs each individual uh, property owner. In a parcel tax, you're asking them to actually approve that tax. And so that tax rate is front and center to the voters. And so um, basing that decision in some research about what the sensitivity to taxes is in your community and the number that you think two thirds of your voters will support is really critical. Um, just a little contextual information on uh, parcel taxes um, here. I'm sorry, I mislabeled the top of that chart. That's this, the parcel tax passage rate uh, in California going back uh, about 10 years. And you can see that, you know, uh, in most elections, parcel taxes pass at a high rate, you know, 70% plus of the measures that are on the ballot. Uh, there are relatively few parcel taxes that do go to the ballot. So it's a little bit of a self-selected group. Um, the one outlier is the March 2020 election. This was true for bond measures as well, where a very uh, low percentage of measures passed. Um, that was largely due to the onset of COVID just a few weeks before that election day and economic turmoil and other concerns. Um, but when prepared properly and presented to voters in the right way, these measures do pass at a pretty significant rate. Um, you may have read in the news recently that there is an opportunity to pass parcel taxes with a simple majority vote. Um, under current law, that is true. Uh, however, there's a very specific process for that. So boards of education like yours can vote to place parcel taxes on the ballot. Another way to get a measure on the ballot is through the citizens initiative process where you go out and collect signatures from citizens in order to qualify that for the ballot. Um, current law says that if citizens uh, qualify an initiative for the ballot um, and it passes with a simple majority vote, then it will take effect. Whereas if the school board puts it on the ballot, it requires a two thirds vote. Um, there are some complications with this approach though. It sounds a little too good to be true and, and it probably is. One, California school districts are not subject to the initiative law, which means that if citizens in your community wanted to uh, prepare an initiative like this, they would have to run it through the city. Um, because they are subject to the initiative law. Um, your boundaries, especially the high school district, don't align well with the city boundaries. So there would be some, some challenges to work through there. Um, and so uh, um, another complication related to this is that the school district can't be involved in the preparation and qualification of the measure. It has to be a truly independent citizen-driven effort. So you do lose some control in that process. Um, probably the most important uh, sort of caveat for this, this option is that a statewide initiative is qualified for the November 2024 ballot that if approved would basically undo this law that allows for the simple majority initiative parcel taxes. Um, and that measure is written to apply retroactively. So even if you pass something before that, it would reach back and require you to put your parcel tax back on the ballot subject to a two thirds confirmation vote. So we'll see what happens with that, but uh, I don't think that uh, that's a particularly attractive option at the moment. Um, these are some examples of simple majority parcel taxes. San Francisco Unified passed one in 2018, Oakland Unified passed one in 2018, and there have been three others on the ballot in 2022, all which failed, uh, mostly due to either active opposition or tax rates that were set at too high a level for the voters to support. Um, so there is a mixed experience uh, in the relatively small number of parcel taxes that have been done by the initiative process. <clears throat> Okay, so now I will transition to uh, talking about the work that we did for the district in 2018. So at that time, due to budget challenges, the district was considering placing a parcel tax on the ballot. Um, we went through the process of assessing the feasibility of a parcel tax. We developed potential parcel tax rates. We developed potential uses of those funds. And we conducted a public opinion survey of voters in your community to measure support for a potential measure. 
Uh, and what we saw was pretty encouraging. Um, we saw support both in the high school and elementary district above the two thirds threshold, it was a little over 70% in the elementary area and uh, just below 70% in the high school area. Incidentally, those levels of support are very similar to the levels of support that we just saw for measure C and G. So it seems like there's kind of a consistent, stable group of supporters uh, in your community that will support the schools. Um, when we looked at the tax rate sensitivity uh, in that polling, we saw that sort of the sweet spot for the high school district was around $50 per parcel. That would generate about $3 million annually for the district. And for the elementary school district, it would generate uh, uh, $75 was the tax rate that generated support above two thirds. And that would generate about a million dollars annually. Um, as we look ahead, I think all these numbers need to be revisited. All this work was done pre-COVID, so we're in a different world now. And uh, we we'll wanna take a fresh look at that. Um, some other findings from that survey, an eight year sunset was the number that your voters were willing to support. And um, the voters definitely valued having an exemption for uh, seniors and those low income homeowners, um, and also an independent citizens oversight Com committee for accountability. Um, the survey that we conducted in 2018 also uh, presented a variety of different uses of parcel tax funds. And the list here is in the priority order that voters told us they would want to see the dollars used for. So at the top of the list, um, kind of core academic uses, programming, especially in the STEM areas. Um, second item is also STEM related plus technology. Um, music at every elementary school, attracting and retaining excellent teachers, enhancing reading and writing programs. So you can get a sense of the types of priorities. This is pretty consistent with what we see in most school districts. Those priorities are, are pretty uh, consistent. Um, so I would expect that if we do updated research, we would see similar priorities. Uh, so then in terms of timing, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you have a lot of flexibility. You can put the, these measures on the ballot uh, in special elections or regularly scheduled elections. Uh, looking ahead, there are two remaining elections in 2023 where there's still time to qualify for that ballot. There's an August 29th all mail-in ballot election and a November 7th uh, special election. Um, those are both, you know, special elections are expensive for the district to administer. You have to, you have to pay the county for the cost of, you know, the mailing ballots and operating voting locations. So oftentimes districts will look to the regularly scheduled primary and general elections in order to save costs on the election administration. So as we get into 24, you do have those opportunities available to you. California statewide primary election will be March 5th of 2024. Um, I think that could potentially be an attractive election date um, because you'll have generally higher voter turnout. You won't have the higher cost of the election. And when we look at the demographic makeup of turnout in recent primary elections in California, it's been pretty favorable. Um, you also have a couple of uh, special elections in 24 you can consider. Uh, but again, you'll have those higher costs. And then, of course, uh, we'll have the November 5th presidential general election in 2024. So that would also be an option for you. Um, the little boxes off to the uh, right side of the chart um, show an important difference in when you would start receiving funding based on when you conduct the parcel tax election. So basically, uh, there's a deadline every summer by which you have to achieve voter approval and deliver that information to the county's assessor's office so that they can put any new taxes on the following year's property tax bills that go out in the fall. Um, and so that means that you need your voter approval basically by that May election in 2024 in order to start receiving funds in the 24-25 fiscal year. Once you go past that, you wouldn't start receiving funds until the 25-26 uh, fiscal year. Slide. Can, uh, I see that Vice President Medina's hand is up for a question. Can question. we take questions at this time? Is that okay? So, yeah, I just had a quick question. You, you indicated March, the March primary being a good uh, um, option for uh, a parcel tax potentially. But I'm just looking at the, the passage rates from the last the, the last presidential primary year in March, and it was like the worst. And I'm curious if you could provide insights to why it might have been that way, that primary, and why, why you think this one would be better than that presidential primary. Yeah, I, I had a bunch of measures on that March uh, 2020 primary election ballot. And actually, if you go back and look at the turnout was quite favorable in terms of the partisan splits and the age splits. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of analysis, you know, to try to understand why we had such a low passage rate in that election. And 
it, it, it was just a real outlier of an election. So in mid-February, it's when, you know, go back and look at the headlines, that's when the world realized that COVID was a big deal and it was gonna disrupt our lives and it was gonna have impacts on the economy. And, um, you know, voters were forced to make voting decisions before they had full information. You know, are my kids gonna be in school? Am I gonna have a job, right? And when voters are uncertain, and especially in a very dramatic situation like that, they tend to hedge their bets and vote no. So I wouldn't read too much into that March 2020 experience because unless we have a similar, you know, major event of that magnitude, um, I would think that support's going to bounce back to more uh, typical levels. That's certainly what we saw in November of 2020, June of 2022, the last primary, and then the November 2022 election when you all were successful with CNG. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and that's actually a great segue to talk about uh, the planning process. So. I would advise, you know, what, what we don't need to do is pick an election date tonight. Uh, what we need to do is engage in a process to evaluate the various options. You know, when's the right time to go to the ballot? How much are we gonna ask for? What are we gonna try to fund? You know, all those, those key uh, questions. And the way we do that is similar to how we approached measure C and G and your other ballot measures, right? We start by um, asking the question, is this feasible? And the way we measure that feasibility is we understand, okay, here's what we're gonna ask voters for. We present that to voters in the space of a public opinion poll. We collect statistically reliable data, and then we bring re recommendations back to you based on that. So that feasibility study would be the first step in the process. Um, it certainly happens in parcel taxes where you have that high two thirds threshold that the result of that feasibility study is this isn't viable right now. And we'll come back and, and tell you that. And if that is the case, then the process stops at that point. Um, if we do see a path forward like we did in 2018, and the next steps after that are to start the conversation with the broader community, make sure they understand your funding needs, understand the proposal that you're planning to put before them, you know, collect feedback, make sure that you're taking concerns into account, um, and then also take what we've learned from the polling and the outreach and build that measure. And then that comes to the board for consideration. If you adopt a resolution placing a parcel tax on the ballot, then we move over into the campaign phase. So just like we did for CNG, District can't use public resources to campaign for the measure. All advocacy has to be privately funded. So you create an independent campaign committee like we did for the bonds, um, recruit community members to get involved, get your stakeholders engaged to volunteer, raise private funds to, to run that uh, election. Um, that deadline for the board to call the election can be no later than 88 days prior to the election date that you're planning to put a measure on the ballot. So there's about a three month lead time uh, prior to any election, you might want to place a measure on the ballot. Um, and then wrapping up here, um, just some thoughts on initial steps in order to get the process started. If you're, you're ready to take a look at a parcel tax, um, I think the first step is to go back and look at the work we did in 2018, where we modeled different revenue amounts, tax rates, et cetera, update that information based on your current parcels. We can also look at the uh, option of a square footage based parcel tax here and how much that would generate, see if that's an option. Um, if we wanna look at both, we can do our polling with a split sample. So half the respondents here, a square footage based tax and the other half get a, a per parcel approach. And that way we'll have good data to compare both options for you. Um, update the use of potential funds. I'm sure things have changed since 2018. So we'd wanna know how you might wanna utilize a parcel tax. We would conduct that opinion poll and then bring the recommendations back to you for consideration. Um, and if we want to keep, you know, that March 2024 election option on the table, we do need to get moving uh, with this work because uh, that deadline to qualify for the March ballot is basically going to be uh, at the beginning of December. So no later than an October or November board meeting, you would have to make making decisions about placing the measure on the ballot. So um, and then if we get a green light from there, we begin with the outreach and the consensus building uh, moving towards an election. So that's what I have to share, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Director Flores. Um, thank you. Very thorough. Uh, you answered a lot of my questions that I had as you, work, as you went along. Um, in, in terms of, and maybe this is a campaign sort of question, in, in terms of um, foreseeable opposition, um, Will that be also in your feasibility study as, uh, as to what sort of uh, things we should be looking out for? Yep. So the, the way uh, these polls are constructed, and this is what we did for measure CNG, is you present a potential ballot measure to voters, you measure their kind of baseline opinions before they've been exposed to other information, then you tell them more about the measure, you know, details about the tax rate and what the money will be used for and whatnot. 
But then we also simulate campaigns pro and con by reading you know, common arguments in favor, common arguments against, and then we ask them of how they would vote on the ballot measure again. So that gives you a sense of not just where you are today, but where would you be after a campaign? And that will tell you, you know, what are the most salient opposition arguments that you have to be able to head off and what impact would that opposition have? And will you be able to recognize or, or um, isolate um, organizations that might be um, naturally opposed, uh, opposed to, um, to a partial tax? Yeah, that, that's typically not included in the polling, but certainly in thinking about an outreach strategy, we would think about potential sources of opposition, how we reach out to them, you know, hopefully bring them on board or at least keep them neutral on a, on a measure like this. When you need a two thirds vote, opposition is tough, right? I mean, they only have to win a third of the vote to defeat the measure. So um, trying to have an environment like we had for measure C and G where there was really nobody campaigning against the measure, that's, that's critical. Um, and in terms of um, if the new uh, legislature that is, or it's not a legislature, it's not legislature, what, what is it called? Um, the new um, law that is trying to pass uh, where you can go retroactively and uh, if it did not pass by, by a simple majority, you have to go by two thirds and you said, um, uh, retroactively, what did that actually mean? Uh, if it was passed retro, um, like in 2018 or 2019, do they have to pay the funds back to the uh, payers? Or I don't understand what, what that actually meant. Yeah, yeah. So let's say if, if somebody passed a uh, parcel tax buy initiative in November of 2022, right. and then the statewide initiative passes in November of 2024, that measure will have to go back to the ballot and get a two thirds vote in order for that district to keep collecting the funds. To keep collecting. To keep collecting the funds. Now, I know in other circumstances, school districts have been sued and had their parcel taxes challenged. And oftentimes while that is playing out, they will collect the funds, but put those funds in escrow oh, okay. um, because they may have to pay that back. So it's a, I mean, and that's, that's the risk of trying one of those right now is that you run the risk of doing all that work and then having it be for nothing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more question, sorry. Uh, in terms of equity, right, uh, one of the things I've heard is that uh, the uh, per par parcel versus the uh, square footage, uh, it's not an equitable sort of thing, especially for uh, low socioeconomic you know, folks. So how do we go about this? Because there isn't uh, something in here that exempts uh, uh, people of a certain, you know, uh, income. Uh, it's pretty specific that you have to be, you know, a senior citizen with a disability, right? Uh, or low income uh, senior citizen, uh, but not for low income folks. So um, how do we go about this in terms of equity? Uh, so the challenge here is that the California law is very rigid on how you can structure a parcel tax. So basically you have per parcel or per square foot. Those are the two methodologies available to you. Um, the per parcel approach is certainly regressive, right? I mean, you're, you have large businesses that are paying the same amount as a small single family home, um, or you can do per square footage, um, but that obviously has an impact on some of those the biggest properties. And so that sometimes that can generate some opposition. So you just have to kind of wade through the, the pros and cons of those. In terms of the exemptions, there are only three defined categories for exemptions. So it's the purely age-based exemption, 65 plus. If you're a homeowner, you can exempt your primary residence, doesn't take in income into account. Um, and then there are two categories of low-income people with disabilities that can qualify for an exemption. And those are people that qualify for SSI benefits or federal SSDI benefits. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, President Medina. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm a little ignorant on uh, some sort of taxation as what a parcel is in the sense of apartments in my trustee area. There's tons of apartments, five levels up going on right now. So it's like that whole apartment complex, a parcel is each individual apartment considered a par parcel. And, and also um, the square footage has that assessed in, in, in a multi-level um, buildings. Sure. So, um, but the parcel is essentially the lot, right? Just that plot of land that a home or apartment or business is built upon. Um, and, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward when you're talking about single family residences, because it's typically one residence, one parcel. 
Um, when you get into multifamily residential, whether that be, you know, apartments, condos, townhouses, things like that, it gets a little more complicated because oftentimes when those are built, a developer will, you know, purchase 10 parcels and build a, an apartment building across those. So the person that pays that parcel tax is the property owner. So it's going to be the landlord in the case of, a, of an apartment building. Um, and so they would pay whatever the parcel tax rate is times those 10 parcels that they own. And they're responsible for that. All the property owners are responsible for it, not the tenants. Um, of course, you know, landlords take that into account when setting rent, rents and uh, they'll pass through those costs to their tenants in, in some fashion. Um, but typically the, you know, the amount that an, that an individual tenant would pay would be a fraction because the cost of that parcel tax is being spread across all the units, right? And all the tenants. Um, same thing for when you get outside of residential properties, commercial and industrial properties, oftentimes the shopping center will be built on across many parcels. Um, so, and the, the square footage, the way that works, it's the square footage of building improvements. So the actual building, not the um, land. Um, and the, uh, um, I'm trying to remember what your question was related to that. Um, well, like on multi-floor apartments, is it square footage of each floor or is it just the total of that? Building? It's the total building square footage. So yeah, I mean, if you have 10 stories, then it would be the you know, square footage for that entire space. Um, and then that would be used to calculate the tax. Again, that tax would be, you know, presented to the property owner who receives the property tax bill, and then they would be responsible for figuring out how they pass that cost through to tenants. And, and my second question is in the parcel planning process. There's feasibility study, then building consensus. But I was curious as, as to in the feasibility study, like the questions that you ask to see what people are for, like. Um, in, in developing those questions and what the money spends for, is there any um, collaboration within you know, our different bargaining units, for example, to, to figure out what, what we should include as part of those questions? Is that part of the plan process? Um, yeah. Sure, yeah, actually, when we did this work in 2018, we had sort of a parcel tax planning committee that met to discuss, you know, what do we wanna see in a parcel tax? What do we wanna get out of it? And we used that group to, review the uh, questionnaire and provide feedback on it. So yeah, that can absolutely be collaborative. Any other questions from the board? Director La Cruz and then Director Sheffield. Um, I wanted to go back to this question around um, the sunsetting of, of the tax and polling specifically around sunsetting. Did you get a sense in past polls around kind of, you, you said there was like a target sunset. Is there any, um, appetite for not not sunsetting this parcel tax in our community? Um, I don't believe we tested uh, indefinite parcel tax in 2018. And the reason for that is, is because, you know, the hardest parcel tax election you'll ever run is the initial one to establish the parcel tax, you know, going from nothing to something. And then after that, you know, once voters see the benefit of the measure, the renewals become easier. So typically the initial parcel tax will have a shortish duration on it. Um, what we found in the, the polling in 2018 was that eight years was a comfort level for, for voters. Um, I mean, the, the, the duration is essentially an accountability protection, right? It tells the voters that this isn't going to go on forever. I get a chance to reconsider this and decide if we still need it. Um, and so when you start talking beyond 10 years, that sounds like a long time to voters and they want an opportunity to revisit it sooner than that. I mean, we do have parcel taxes that are more like five or six years. Challenge there is that, you know, it's hard to produce results that quickly. Um, so I think something in that eight year range is, is typically the sweet spot. Just a reminder to our board that the reason why we're in this mess in the first place is because of Prop 13 and our inability to tax people based on their wealth rather than um, kind of this, it is a deeply regressive approach to fundraising for our schools and that's what we're left with. So I'm really grateful for your work and thank you for your continued dedication to helping Santa Rosa City Schools stay afloat and, and thrive. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Heath. Um, you had mentioned early in the presentation that only 9% of districts in California um, have used parcel tax, and I believe most of them in the Bay Area. Is that, is that right? Can you explain why that might be? I mean, it's, it's really just the, the politics of the situation. When you need a two thirds vote, you know, you kind of have to have the right demographics in the community, you know, kind of a progressive tilt in the community typically. Um, if you look at the, the profile of districts that have parcel taxes, they tend to be, you know, high performing schools, oftentimes affluent school districts, you know, where there's a real value placed on, on, on uh, maintaining the quality of schools in the community for property values and other reasons. 
Um, but also, you know, some of the larger urban districts around the Bay Area, mm -hmm. San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, West Contra Costa, they all have parcel taxes as well. Um, they are really uncommon in Southern California. There's, uh, I think, you know, maybe a dozen school districts that have parcel taxes, Santa Monica, Malibu, and um, Los Angeles Unified tried, but they were not successful. There, there's a few others. So yeah, I was just trying to get a sense of why that might be. And I think a question Trustee Flores had brought up was around you know, sort of profiling who might be the opposition. Um, and for us to think about um, if we are to move forward with this, thinking who in the community um, might have an issue. You know, they're probably, you know, we can think of names, but these would then be. Um, the people that we would want to have discussion with would want to, you know, bring them in to be a part of um, these discussions, kind of try to get a sense of where they stand on this. Um, a couple other questions I'll hold off. I, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Director Fong. Thank you, Charles. I just wanted to clarify this feasibility study the district pays for. Yeah, all of the um, the entire planning process up until the board votes to place the measure on the ballot can be funded by the district. So you don't need to raise private dollars for that. But once you have a measure on the ballot, the subsequent advocacy campaigning is what has to be privately funded. That's my only question right now. Uh, Vice President Medina. Um, so what, one thing that you mentioned was the 88 days. So for, let's say, for example, the March 5th, I mean, the December 8th is the 88 days prior to that, but can it be put, would we be able to vote any time prior to that for that date? Or is there like a certain window that we have to? Yeah, uh, you, you can certainly do it um, earlier than that. Um, although you typically don't want to do it too much earlier because when you do adopt that resolution mm -hmm. placing the measure on the ballot, that cuts off the district's ability to continue communicating with the public and whatnot. So you typically want to maximize that amount of time. And then at your sort of last board meeting before that 88 day deadline, adopt the resolution and move into the campaign. And in terms of the process and the, the, the study, um, how, long, how long do you anticipate that would take? The feasibility study usually takes about two to three months max time. And really, the, I mean, the, the polling itself only takes about a week, um, but it's the process of engaging with stakeholders, developing the questions that takes some time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, Two to three months is probably a good estimate of what it's going to take us to come back to you with some recommendations. And then it's your choice if we move forward from there or we just cut the process off at that point. So if let's say that we were to approve this, um, we'd expect to see this maybe back in May, the results of a study. Yep. But before we would, their strategy, as you had mentioned in postponing a vote on the resolution though, because that would limit the amount of discussion that we could have moving forward. So we would really want to be strategic um, in laying out how we want to bring this forward and maximize as much as we can the time um, to communicate, have these conversations. Yep. Yeah, the May, June timeframe is when we would be bringing back recommendations to you, not a resolution, just, you know, here's what we're seeing yeah. in the opinion research. Here's what we think is viable. And we're going to be asking you for the green light to move forward with the subsequent steps to do the community outreach, um, develop the measure for the ballot. And then, you know, at that point, we'll have a better sense of what our desired election date is. And then we can peg that board action to actually adopt the resolution to the deadline for qualifying for that ballot. And then uh, my question maybe might be around, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. My question might be around um, the costs that the district would absorb as well. Um, is there any sense of what a ballpark of that might be if we were? For the, the planning process? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my contract that I think is on your agenda later, uh, my consulting fee is 6500 a month. That's the same amount we charge for CNG and prior measures. Um, and, you know, the duration is going to depend on, you know, How whether or not we, we go forward from that feasibility study to the subsequent phases. But at most, it's probably, you know, seven or eight months worth of work. Okay. Uh, if we go all the way to the end, um, there's the cost of the polling, um, which, you know, is sort of in the mid 30,000 range. That's similar to what we did for measure C and G. Um, and then if we do get to the point where we're doing communications to the public, uh, informational communication from the district, you know, informational mailings, you know, online advertising, things like that, um, that would be an additional cost. And that's estimated in my contract as well. Okay. And that, so the scope of work, what you're saying is seven to eight months. Is yep. Okay. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Okay, this is a discussion item. We will move on to public comment. If there are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E, uh, I'm sorry, E4, please raise your hand at this time. President Manieri, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Bringing this back to the board for any further discussion. Director Fung. Again, thank you, Charles and Lisa for being here. You know, one of our uh, strategic priorities on our mission vision is financial stability. You know, it's one of the goals we set for ourselves when we, when we wrote and rewrote and revisited our strategic plan. And so we worked on um, CNG with this firm and uh, our community worked on it. And if we want the world-class schools that we want, we have to keep working for, for dollars because the state of California is really not meeting their, their obligation. As we, as we hear day after day, we hear, we don't have enough this, that, or the other, right? And we can only do so much with what we have. And so a parcel tax, as regressive as it is, and it hurts my heart, that a $400,000 house pays the same parcel tax as a 5,000 square foot house or a multi-block business possibly. But as we have explored parcel taxes and other taxes, there doesn't seem to be another way to find money for our schools. And we, our community needs to hear what we're doing, what we need, and decide that yes, they want these kinds of schools and yes, they're gonna open up their pocketbooks to pay for it, whether or not they have kids in schools. Because, you know, in my opinion, of course, in your opinion too, it's, it's everyone's obligation to provide a quality education for their community. So it actually breaks my heart that we are having to go to our community when our state is really not making, making the grade. Um, but there is a way and we have a, a, a proven, um, partner here in front of us. But I also know that this is going to be all hands on deck in our community. That, you know, we throw around, we throw around the word transparency so much. And also, it, it's almost weaponized to me. You're not transparent. We are transparent. You're not transparent. You know, but it just means good communication and it means good relationships and it means letting people know what they need to know. Right, and, and we each need to share that, all of us, everybody in our community needs to share this. You know, we have talked um, individually and small groups, we've talked with, with community partners in our community, all, all different kinds, and all of them wanna support education. And so I would like to um, move forward with this, but keep our community partners right close, keep them informed, ask them, partner with them. It's not just our school district that is doing this. Our whole community needs to do this. And again, frankly, if we're, you know, we're going to be looking at how much money we're going to be get to, to, to ask for. That 4 million is nothing. It is a drop in the bucket for what a school district this size needs. I mean, uh, our associate superintendent is nodding her head. We're already, I think that much in debt already looking ahead that you could just plug a hole. Voters don't want to tax themselves to plug a hole. So we're going to have to be really strategic about how we, we shepherd our monies, we steward our monies. You know, we're doing the very best for our, for our kids under our care, for, for the people who work with in our district who provide for children. Um, but I can't see any other way to do this. I really can't, and we need it. Thank you, Director Fong. See a lot of head nods. Are there any other, uh, is there more discussion that this board would like to have on this item? Okay, and I just uh, wanna clarify, Superintendent, this is a, a discussion item, but you uh, hear direction from the board about continuing this feasibility. Is this what we're doing here? I just wanna make sure. So this is just to present 
uh, options and understanding the moving parts. If the board would like to proceed, there is a contract under, I believe that has been pulled um, tonight by um, Vice President Medina. Um, I think there was a clarifying question and we'll get to that, um, but that would set the, the balance. Understood, thank you. Thank you both for presenting this to us and for bringing all of this information forward. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Moving on to item E5 this evening, this is another action item. Adoption of board teleconferencing provisions. The board will consider adopting board teleconferencing provisions as specified in the Ralph and Brown Act or from Assembly Bill 2449. And I will hand this over to Superintendent Trinnell. And Namita Brown is also joining us from our legal team. Um, she will be moved over as a panelist online uh, in the event that there are any questions from the board tonight. Um, as you recall from the special board meeting last week, there was some information presented to the board about AB 2449. Um, as you may recall, the governor is set to expire the current state of emergency as of February 28 and therefore AB 361, which you will notice is not an agenda item tonight because it does sunset next week as well with the removal of the state of emergency. In that case, there are two options for the board to consider tonight, either returning to the Brown Act specifications in how to conduct ourselves during a board meeting and specifically board members um, in attendance of the board meeting or Assembly Bill 2449 um, as you can see here, I've tried to provide some comparisons for you. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the major points between the two. Um, as you will also notice um, under the Brown Act, if the board were to uh, elect and adopt, because that is the key word, adopt going back to the Brown Act specifications. Um, if a board member is going to be remote, the location of that, um, board member must be made public. We would be posting that location printed on the agenda and that location would have to be made available to anyone within the vicinity of that location, wherever that board member is, which could mean if they're at home in a hotel room or another place, um, the agenda would be posted outside that location and any person in the public would be allowed to enter and also engage with the board. Um, and, and comment. Um, that is one telling characteristic um, for the Brown Act. Um, also, um, teleconferencing by the Brown Act would have to be, would continue to be an option for audio and or video. Um, and then um, the virtual attendance by the board member does not need board approval in advance, but we do need to know in advance for agenda posting. Um, and please, Ms. Brown, please jump in if I misspeak at all. Um, under Assembly Bill 2449, um, this does allow for board members to be remote as long as there is an in-person number of board members to make a quorum, which in this case for this board is four. So it would require four board members to be in person in order for a, other board members to be remote. Um, the only location that would need to be posted is the where the meeting is in person. So the board members would not need to post um, where they, the board members, we, it would have to be specified where they're going to be. However, they do not need to open the space to the public or post the agenda in that space. Um, and for teleconferencing, under AB 2449, you must have your video on and your audio on. Um, it's not either or, which is different from the Brown Act. In addition, there are two um, basic circumstances for a board member to be remote. One is just cause, um, and that does not require board approval. Um, and there's emergency circumstance which would require board approval. We can go into the nuances of how that happens, but we did discuss that last week. Um, and then um, under AB 2449, wherever the remote board member is, if there is someone who is 18 or older, 
in the space with the board member, that has to be disclosed publicly. Also the relationship of that person or people uh, to the board member. And anything, Ms. Brown, that I know you're here for questions, but anything salient? Um, no, at the end of the day, um, the Brown Act and Assembly Bill 2449 only uh, you know, addresses how meetings are conducted. Uh, the regular Brown Act provisions with respect to everything else in terms of agenda and posting, all of that remains as is. So I, I didn't want anyone to think as you look at the um, as you look at the materials that by choosing AB 2449, you are getting rid of the other parameters of the Brown Act. They remain in force. It's only regarding meeting and conduct uh, and roll calls and presence. And I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Are there any board member questions? Director Sheffield. Hi, Namita. I just have a quick question about um, AB 2449 and um, the, the um, video audio requirement. And I'm wondering, are there any considerations if there's a technical issue or if we just, for whatever reason, we have it now. We have issues sometimes just on, a, on our, our local regular Zoom. Um, somebody's having a, a, um, a connection issue. Does that exclude them automatically if something like that comes up or is there any type of except, exception or exemption? Um, so AB uh, 2449 is more restrictive in many ways, uh, especially when it comes down to technology malfunctioning. Uh, what it clearly states is that should technology malfunction, the board cannot take any action. Yeah. Um, so um that that is that is uh one of the that is one of the limitations of ab 2449 um no, that is it, not, okay and if it, if if it is you know a single if there is a, a a quorum is that board member excluded then or we just can't take an action if a board member was present and suddenly in the middle of the situation in the middle of the action item um there is a technical glitch um, that is correct, Trustee Sheffield, uh, but it's more than that under 2449. Um, it's about not just the board members having technical difficulties, it's the member of the public. Right. No, and, I, I, under, I understand yeah. that. I, I, I'm yes. getting down to the actual um, board member. Okay. Yes, uh, the board member as well. And um, there is the other piece uh, under 2449 where should the board as a as a body vote not to accept the emergency exception of uh, the board member who wants to join remotely, um, then that automatically excludes the board member from participating and they cannot, uh, even though they're on the call, they are um, uh, present uh, visually as, as well as uh, telephonically or uh, via voice, uh, they are excluded from participating as a board member, they will only be present in their capacity as a member of the public. So I'm trying. I'm trying to envision a, a circumstance where we might have a critical vote. the The board has made the decision to allow the remote um, um, board member to attend to participate. Everything seems to be going well. We get close to um, the agenda item that must be passed because we have a, a time sensitive issue. Um, and we have moved forward as if that board member is present, then there's a circumstance that presents itself where maybe we have video and no audio or audio and no video, um, which again, we've seen time and time again um, on, uh, on Zoom issues. How do we move forward? What do we do? Um, so um, if, you were, if you were under the Brown Act, regular Brown Act process, which, which I will refer oh. to as the default process, if you were on the re under the regular process, the board could still do its business because it does not require presence both um, uh, visually as well as um, you know uh, from with voice, so both audio and video. Uh, so you could theoretically conduct the business of the board despite any interruptions. Uh, with AB uh, twenty four forty nine. 
um, again, it limits you. It puts you in a space, and I, I will use an example. For example, you've got first interim reports that have to be done by yeah. a certain date, or you've got layoff resolutions um, that you must act on. And if you have that uh, interruption of technology uh, of one board member, it's going to tie the hands of the entire board yep. uh, because it can be. So the board can take action. I, I will say this too, because I have to parse out the fine details for you. The board could take action, uh, but it would be subject to challenge. And um, it's a new law, so it, we do not know how it's going to be ruled upon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice President Medina. I don't have questions. I'm just waiting for comment. Oh, got it. OK. Are there other questions? Um, I, I have one question. So regardless of the action that we take tonight with regard to how um, the board chooses to move forward with our meetings, um, can members of the public still join hybrid and give public comment hybrid regardless of, of the decision that we take tonight? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That is the board's prerogative because you're only increasing um, options for members of your public to join. Uh, if you were to be under the uh, default Brown Act provisions, uh, the uh, the presence of a hybrid platform allowing your members of the community to comment is not prohibited. So as long as you're enhancing their ability to participate, I, I don't think we are going to run afoul any um, California law issues. Thank you. We will move on to public comment at this time. If there are members of the public and would like to comment on item E5, joining us on Zoom, please raise your hand at this time. There are no hands raised. Thank you. Bringing this back to the board for further questions, discussion, or a motion. Vice President Medina, do you have a discussion? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, at our last special study session to me it just became more clear that I that I'm very supportive of the Ralph and Brown Act version uh, AB 2449 just seems so restrictive. My, my, my concern was the issue of like a member being um, at their house and having to disclose their address in terms of that but um, I think that in most times when a member is within the district, they'll be present here. Um, and, and um, all the other times you're probably outside the district somewhere. Um, I've never had an issue with people not showing up at my hotel room door, showing up. So for me, that's not personally a concern, but but I think there's so many restrictions with AB 2449 um, option um, that that it's going through the Ralph O'Brien Act version is what makes most sense to me. Um, and yeah, everything else seems so complicated. Uh, sorry, I do have one question and kind of going off of um, if, if we were to move forward with the, the Brown Act uh, provision, if a board member joins remotely or through teleconference under the Brown Act, um, the facility at which they are at, does, does that facility, whether that be their home or a hotel or whatever uh, the case might be, does that have to be ADA compliant? Yes, it has to be access. Oh, so it talks about accessibility. So access under this has always been viewed as giving public the option of showing up, understanding that you're going to have people's homes that are not go going to be ADA accessible. Uh, you're, you may be uh, in a different part of the world where ADA accessibility is not the same as the United States. So uh, when when the Brown Act talks about accessibility, it is more than ADA. It is about making sure that public can come in and participate in the meeting uh, should you happen to be outside the jurisdiction of, or outside uh, outside uh, utilizing the teleconference exception in the Brown Act. Okay. I'm just wondering if that's gonna be a, a barrier to anyone joining. Uh via teleconference if we move forward with the Brown Act. Just the fact that I, I know my home isn't super accessible. I mean, I have stairs in my to, to get to my front door. So that's already not ADA compliant. So that's, so, that's what uh, maybe I'm thinking I did not, uh, maybe I was not clear. So uh, President uh, Mineri, I just wanna be very clear that the accessibility is not in terms of ADA accessibility. It's about giving people the ability to be present in the space 
where you are. So the accessibility is giving them the opportunity to be able to participate in a meeting from the location that you are in rather than the accessibility of uh, complying with um, the ADA or uh, California law around um, you know, making it accessible for uh, disability. So I, I want to be very clear that the word is accessible, but it is more about giving people the opportunity to participate rather than a disability accessibility accommodation. Okay, Director de la Cruz. Thank you um, so much, Namir. I appreciate this um, opportunity to ask questions. So I think the question that I have around the Brown Act is that um, if there was a last minute change in somebody's family needs or whatever, we would actually not be able to participate virtually because our location would need to be posted 72 hours in advance to be compliant with the Brown Act. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. So the default location would require that the agenda be posted 72 hours prior to the board meeting uh, with the location of the board member utilizing the teleconference option. Uh, so yes, that would be uh, that would be one of the issues that is going to prevent you from participating. Thank you. <laughs> Director Bowie and Director Fong. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the, your time. And then I also wanted you to clarify on if there's like a specific reason why the Brown Act you're given the opportunity to either use audio and or video, but then in the assembly bill, you have to use both. Okay, so um, the Brown Act has been around for a long time um, and it hasn't caught up with the law. AB 2449 is a product of 2023 and therefore 2022 legislative session. So it, it talks about both the audio and video options. Uh, when the original Brown Act was written, it was all just you know, regular telephone. And so anytime we talk about giving additional options under the Brown Act by providing people access to perhaps a Zoom platform or giving them option to, uh, uh, to participate either remotely or in person, we are giving them more than what the Brown Act envisions because it was it was written in the 60s and 70s. And so that is that is the predominant difference. Thank you. Director Fong and then Director Flores. I think I'm talking out loud so I can try to understand this. The Brown Act is old. It used to be if somebody couldn't go, so you could call in and there wasn't really video then. I think that's what happened. I don't remember anyone ever doing it. And if you couldn't go to the meeting, you just didn't go to the meeting. I think the AB 2449 is really in response to this hybrid remote thing that we've been doing since COVID with the intent to, that board members need to be together at board meetings with the exception of maybe five times is how I read it. I just said that out loud to myself to try and understand. I do value us being here together. Director Flores. Yes, I'd like to move for approval for the board to consider adopting um, board teleconferencing, the uh, board teleconferencing provision as specified in the Ralph M. Brown Act. Second. That was moved by Director Flores and seconded by Director Medina, Vice President Medina. Um, is there any other discussion before we move to a roll call vote? With the special caveat that Zoom options for access for you know, our community is also available, okay, per our President Moneri's suggestion. Okay, by me. Oh, I'm sorry, we did not do public comment. That's, wait, did we? Did we do public comment? We did. We did do public comment. Great, so we have a motion on the table that was um, moved by Director Flores and seconded by Vice President Medina. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Fong. No. Director McNally. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. We are now on item E6, 
Another action item, approval of board governance handbook. The Santa Rosa City Schools board members will consider approval of the board governance handbook to serve as a framework for effective governance. Um, and I will hand this over to Vice President Medina to start us off with this item. I think this was brought up at the previous meeting where I wasn't here. And um, since that meeting, I think it went back to Superintendent Trinnell to add some additional changes from that meeting. So maybe uh, Superintendent Trinnell, could you update us on the changes you made since then, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, board, uh, per your request, I did go back. There were a couple of specific requests that the changes are highlighted so that you can see what exactly was changed. And then also, um, uh, Trustee De La Cruz had asked if there would be any language introduced regarding the nuances of communication with the board and the community and uh, where the superintendent falls in. And that's actually already within the, the handbook. Um, there are several sections that speak to, um, for example, when the board receives something from the public, you are more than welcome to respond. Um, however, it's always good practice to loop the superintendent in so that I can begin directing staff if there's any action to be taken, et cetera. Uh, I also added in um, student board member, Julie um, Bowie, who wasn't represented in the, um, the initial copy that was presented in January. So I have added her um, to that uh, as a part of the document as well. Um, the, and then I provided you the draft copy and a clean copy. One thing that you will notice in the clean is that July has been stricken um, because in the original, it said that we would meet in July. Um, I did not clean up the strike of July because you were going to take action tonight on the revision of that board calendar. So I will clean, clean it up since there has been action to um, remove July as a regular board meeting month. And in the approval, will we now remove the references to AB 2449 per our last vote? And also to clarify the, because of the, also, do, do we also remove the AB 361 reference or we leave that in there? Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Are there any board member questions on this item? Okay, we will move on to public comment. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom and would like to comment on item E6. Please raise your hand at this time. President Manieri, there are no hands raised. Thank you. Bringing this back to the board for any further discussion, questions, or a motion. Vice President Medina. I'd like to move that we approve the board governance handbook as presented with the elimination of the AB 361 and AB 2449 references. That was moved by Vice President Medina and seconded by Director Flores and uh, Director Bowie. And then just a quick comment. I just wanted to thank you for making the effort to like show all the drafts because in the past CSBA events that I've attended, they've always really emphasized having a governance handbook. So I'm glad that we're really up to date on it. Thank you. And thank you, Superintendent, for all your work on this. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Fall. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. We're moving on to item E7, another action item, approval of a memorandum of understanding between Santa Rosa City Schools and the Santa Rosa Teachers Association regarding educational specialist mixed caseload and presenting this action item is Ass Assistant Superintendent Shepard. Thank you, President Manieri, members of the board, Superintendent Trinnell, members of the Santa Rosa City Schools community. Um, I'm pleased to bring uh, to you this consideration for this MOU. Grateful to our SRTA partners, um, we, uh, a need was identified to clarify this language. Uh, around mi uh, mixed caseloads, and we were grateful for a quick uh, meeting to uh, problem solve together, and this is the result of our work. So with that, I will take any questions that you have. Thank you. Are there any questions on this item from the board? OK, 
Okay, we will move on to public comment. For members of the public joining us on Zoom, I would like to comment on item E7. Please raise your hand at this time. There are no hands raised. Okay, bringing this back to the board for any further questions, discussion, or a motion. We have approval of the memorandum of understanding between Santa Rosa City School, Santa Rosa Teachers, Associate regarding educational specialist mixed caseload. Second. Second. That was moved by Director Fong and seconded by Director Sheffield. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. And now moving on to item E8, approval of provisional internship permit application, otherwise known as a PIP for Sian Brown, I hope I pronounced that person's name right. Thank you, President Manieri, members of the board, Superintendent Trinnell, Santa Rosa City Schools community. Um, this is our 11th uh, PIP this year. And um, this is a need that we sometimes have when we're trying to fill positions that we've advertised multiple times and we're unable to fill and we identified a candidate that we're able to certify as ready to be in the classroom as with, through this process. So with that, I will um, be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, moving on to public comment. There's members of the public joining us on Zoom who would like to comment on item E7. Please raise your hand. I apologize, E8. There are no hands raised. Okay, so bringing this back to the board for discussion, questions, or a motion. I'd like to move to approve the provisional internship permit application for San Brown. Second. And that was moved by Director De La Cruz and seconded by Director Sheffield. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. Item E9, board member requests for leave of absence reimbursement per EC 44987.3. The Board of Education will consider the request of two board members regarding leave of absence reimbursement to their school district employers as outlined in Education Code 44987.3. And I will hand this over to uh, Directors Flores and McNally. Well, th thank you everyone. And, and thank you, um, uh, President Manieri, uh, fellow school board members. Uh, as a fellow trustee, I'm asking you for your support for our request for a leave of absence to conduct or related business in the state of California. As you know, Trustee McNally and I are employed by separate school districts in Sonoma County, and our responsibilities as school board members may at times require us to schedule an absence from work. Fortunately, California law allows a board member who is an employee of a school district to request a leave of absence of up to 20 school days per school day, per school year. Uh, to conduct board-related uh, business in the state of California as per Education Code 44987.3. I believe that our request is both reasonable and necessary. By allowing us to leave, uh, uh, to take a leave of absence to conduct our board-related business, we are fulfilling our duty to provide us with the necessary resources and flexibility to serve the community more effectively. I would like to emphasize that this request is not only in the interest of Trustee Magnelli and mine, but it's also in the interest of the entire school district. By supporting our request, we are demonstrating our commitment to ensuring that board members who work full time in, school, in the school setting have the necessary resources and flexibility delineated under the law to serve the community to the best of their abilities. On a personal note, I would love to have said yes to the peaceful ceremonies that um, Trustee Fong was able to attend um, the Special Olympics, the site visits from school principals to connect with our students, staff, and parents. But I am out of personal days already because of other trustee duties I took on earlier in the school year. So I urge you, so 
I urge my fellow board members to support our request for a leave of absence to conduct board related business in the state of California allowed under education code 44987.3. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Director McNally. Is there anything you'd like to add? No worries. Um, at this time, we will take questions from board members. Are there any questions for directors Flores and McNally, or maybe just Director Flores right now? No questions. Um, I okay. I do have a few questions. Um, does Education Code four four nine eight seven point three apply to non school employees? So this is a provision just for trustees who are school uh, employees. Okay. Um, yes. Go ahead. It reads um, a leave of absence of up to twenty school days. I don't think you're thinking of taking two full weeks or a month, one day, one day, one day to go to schools or go to the conferences, right? No. No, it's just that uh, last year, for example, we went to the uh, California Latino School Board Association, right? And I used personal days for that. Uh, at CSBA in, in San Diego, right? I took another three days out of that. And that left me with very little uh, personal days to go visit um, uh, schools, you know, and I have no uh, personal days left to go and see the uh, peace full ceremonies. Uh, I've been invited to go to, and I'm sure you all have that, but I've been invited to go to um, various um, ceremonies, right? That I am not able to because um, it would be very cost effective for me to for, uh, for me to lose a, a, a day uh, because I'm out. I only get ten a year, right? And I already use them use it, uh, by doing my trustee duties. Um, I also have another question. Um, I see that your reimbursement is is higher than Director McNally's. Can you explain that? A little sure. Bit? Yes. I mean, I've been in, in the educational system for 25 years. So as you know, um, the, the uh, longer you're in the education field, uh, the uh, higher you pay. So I do not have a sub in Healdsburg, unfortunately. Uh, the uh, folks here in Santa Rosa City Schools are able to get a sub for counselors. Uh, we do not have that luxury. So uh, when I take a day off, it's not well a day off. I still have you know <laughs> all the uh, work that I missed because I couldn't uh, do a a a, a, um, a sub plan for somebody else, right? So um, it's actually you know quite burdensome to take a couple a day from work because the work's still there. So when I come back, it's double double the work. So. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay, we'll move on to public comment. There are members of the public joining us on Zoom who would like to comment on item E9. Please raise your hand at this time. Our first speaker is Deanna Alaveras. Hi, superintendent and board. I oppose this action not because I feel that trustee Flores and McNally don't deserve this compensation, but because simply I do not feel like it's equitable. I honestly wish all public servants were adequately, adequately compensated, but unfortunately that's not the world we live in. Once you decide to run for public office, you forfeit many hours, weeks, and months during your year from your family and your profession to serve the public. This is exactly why I'm, I am very uncomfortable with this action being approved tonight. For the simple fact that if other teachers or employees of school districts knew that this compensation exists or may be offered, maybe they would have chose to run this election, this last election season. But this compensation hasn't happened in the past, so they were unaware of it. If you really want to see teachers treated the same and, and have equity like you all preach, then you if you choose to take action tonight, you would not allow it to become in effect until 2024. Ed code 44987.3, section 3D states, the board, commission, committee, or group agrees prior to service to reimburse the school district pursuant to subdivisions. If you decide to set this precedent in the district, 
be prepared to also, also honor the rest of the ed code that states not only school board members shall be compensated, but also any employee that sits on boards, committees, or educational groups that are mandated by the state be compensated. So this is just the beginning of our family's tax dollars being allocated to make sure school employees have the ability to run for office and no one else. Is that equitable? I don't think so. No, it benefits only people that are currently on the board if you agree to take action tonight. I think we need more representation and more families that attend our school district on the board and not just school employees and nonprofit founders. By compensating these trustees, which in will, it will return, will give their classrooms, students an extra up to 20 days off with most likely un- credentialed or qualified substitute teachers because we all know that we are on a shortage. Oh, but wait, they don't work in our school district, so I guess it doesn't matter. That's not fair. I wonder if you'd feel different if they were SRTA employees. One last thought. If Ed Code stated that all public servants were entitled to the same reimbursement, would you all vote yes and take action if peace officers we're also trustees and receive this, most likely not, because you don't even allow them on our school campuses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President Manieri, there are no other hands raised. Okay, thank you. So bringing this back to the board for any further questions, discussion, or a motion, I see Vice President Medina's hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Um, when I saw this, I was like, wow, I'm surprised that I didn't know about this earlier. I'm strongly supportive of this. Um, I, I think any opportunity to help um, any of us better serve, I'm for it. Unfortunately, this only helps educators, but you know, it's a start. Um, I would um, hope that um, we can make this information available to more. I'm sure there's maybe some of our staff that serve on boards elsewhere that they can know. So that's they could look into that for where they serve. But I'm strongly in support of this uh, resolution, this action. Um, I, I, I did see that it's only available to uh, um, elementary and secondary staff. It's under that section of Edge Code. I was looking for post-secondary because I want to recommend it to junior college folks as well, but it's only for elementary and secondary um, staff. So I just want to say that I strongly support it. And um, along those lines, I'd like to uh, move that we approve the request for leave of absence reimbursement per Ed Code 44987.3 for both uh, members, um, Ever Flores and Roxanne McNally. We have a motion on the table. Second that. Second. And I heard a second from Director Sheffield before we move to a roll call vote. Is there any other discussion? Yes, Director Fong. I'm just going to echo what you said. Omar, because truly, we didn't know. I don't know who found this out, but I think it's great because there's actually more people. And I do know that we have at least one uh, certificate employee who is on a board. So we should let that person know. Um, and yes, leaving your classroom, leaving your office is, is difficult. And I know that when I get to go to things like Peace Bowls and like that, I know that other people cannot. And it's unfortunate also that um, those of you who are working private business or county business or whatever, you know, nonprofits, you're not covered under this. But I think that to lower the barriers to serve on a board, you know, we should take every opportunity. So thank you for finding that. Ditto to all of that. You know, may, may we have a more democratic society when we have people who represent the interests of everybody inside of our systems better represented in leadership positions. So thank you for bringing this up and thank you for continuing to push forward what it means to truly be representative of the of our entire district. So adelante. I also just want to say that I'm, I'm also in a position where I can't just leave my job to go and do things and go to the Latino um, Board Association conferences. And so um, thank you for taking on the kind of the, the responsibility and the things that we, others can, on this board can't do. Um, so I look forward to all the things that you're able to do and, and bring back to this board and bring back to our community. So thank you for doing that. 
echo what everybody else keeps saying, but I just also would just agree that, you know, this allows um, you, it allows any um, public servant uh, in the same position as, as yourselves um, to be able to better represent the constituencies. You're able to be present. I think it's a wonderful service the state of California offers. I think it's a wonderful service um, that you're putting forward for us to, um, to consider uh, um, approving um, this, this, um, this resolution. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Fung. Aye. Director McNally. And you have to abstain. Abstain. Okay. Director Flores. Abstain. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. We have now reached our F items. These are our consent items. Item F5 was pulled by Vice President Medina. So uh, we first need approval of F items one through four and then six through 10. I'd like to move to approve F items one through four and six through 10. Second. I think we need to do two through. Two through, two through four and six through 10. Yes, so two through four and six through 10. Second. Okay, that was moved by Director de la Cruz and seconded by Vice President Medina. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director de la Cruz. Aye. Director uh, Medina. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. And that brings us to item F5, Vice President Medina. Thank you. Um, First, just a couple things um, um, on the on the summary. Um, it looks like the Boys and Girls Club contract um, has an error. It says forty two nine two zero on the summary, but the actual is forty five nine two zero. Um, and just in the total, it doesn't include the the Terry Barnes Walters amount um, in the total cost of that. But my main reason for pulling it was in the Terry Barnes Walters contract. Um, it just lists 6,500 a month and other fees. And one of my questions was how, how many months this would be. Um, I think in the presentation here, I think it was seven to eight. Um, so I just wanted to see if maybe we could uh, do kind of what we did before in another contract on a not to exceed a certain amount. Um, I don't know if uh, there's a recommendation on certain amounts. You know, we heard seven to eight, but, you know, I think it would make sense to no more than maybe like 10 months or something along those lines if, if there's a recommendation. I just generally like to have like a, a limit in terms of what we approve and not approve super open-ended amounts. And um, yeah, so, so that's my first question. Um, I think we heard the clarity as you, you were mentioning, Vice President Medina, so is the question that we bring the contract back with specification to the number of months, or are you asking that there be an amendment to add specification? I, I think it's okay to, to amend that at this point right now. I'm just kind of looking for guidance as to how many months that should be. I know we heard seven to eight. Should we put it like at 10 just to be safe, 12, um, and then add these additional costs. I think it's the hybrid survey and the informational brochure amounts to whatever that total is. Um, suggestions along those lines so that we do put like a finite figure on the not to exceed amount. We heard from Charles Heath, this is his contract. We heard from him earlier where he said around seven months, uh, the board could certainly consider extending that um, in the event that the work is needed again, that particular work is based on sort of our cadence and what we want to see happen and the timeline of that. So there could be the potential of extending it. And if it were to, let's say the board were to select 10 months um, and it were to go to 12, what we would do is bring back an amendment to the contract to allow for the additional time so that they're not working for free. Um, and I don't know, Ms. Cavan, if you have anything to add. Yes, just on the um, the mailings and the polling, those are estimates as well. And so again, 
if we were to look at that, it would be probably a not to exceed and perhaps something higher than that estimate because otherwise then we would be bumping up against bringing it back. So I guess what I would recommend um, that we amend this contract to to be to not to exceed ten months and a uh, hundred thousand dollars in other fees. Okay, thank you very much, Director Medina. Was that a, a motion? Yeah, that would be a motion to amend. Contract number four, um, not to exceed 10 months and $100,000 in other fees or expenses. I don't know the proper word. Director De La Cruz. Yeah, so I don't want to speak for you, Director Kevin, but what I don't want to do is get into a situation where staff has to come back to us in a board item for something that's really simple and administrative because they exceeded by $5,000 or something like that. So. Um, I'd like to see if we can increase the fees and also to be a little bit clearer on fees because we have monthly consulting fee that we have the survey fee and the brochure fee and those are all fees and we would exceed the monthly consulting fee right in 10 months it would be 65,000 so just some clarity there on are you trying to limit the hybrid survey and the mailings to 100,000 so clarity would be 10 months of consulting fee and up to well Based on your suggestion, I would say not to exceed $120,000 of additional expenses and fees tied to the feasibility study. So may I ask for, for clarification, then that would be a total contract not to exceed $185,000 based on those different categories. Is correct. that correct? Thank you. And then a motion. Just another question. Um, does is 10 months sufficient to get us across the finish line to a parcel tax, you know, earliest we were thinking, I think we were talking about March of next year. So that would be 12 months. Well, well, he said seven to eight months, we would vote to put it on by December 8th is the deadline. And then at that, beyond that, I think it would be its own private, it would be outside of us. So Right. My understanding is that this is for the feasibility that. study, okay. right? The feasibility study only. Correct. Cor correct. And so, depending okay. on which election that that the board called for that to be on, that could exceed the ten months if we were to go to later mm. in the year. Right. If it were the March timeline, that would be the seven to eight months. So, really, it just depends on the board's timeline. So again, I'd like to not have staff kind of jumping through hoops that are at this point kind of way off in the future and maybe arbitrary at this stage. So I'd like to say not to exceed 18 months and just give us tons of space if we need to with the not to exceed um, dollar amount. Director Fong. Could you say that again, Director Dela Cruz? Not to exceed da 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 da. Sure. So I think we said not to exceed 185 and change. From what director Kevin did the quick math on on the back end, but I think I'm just I don't want to I don't want to box us in and then have us need to come back in the middle of whatever just to do administrative checking the boxes. So just to give staff a little bit more wiggle room. Um, so 185 and 18 months. So the way that the contract is written, it actually doesn't specify a timeline, and it sounds like that's. Director or Vice President Medina's concern is that is that timeline and that open endedness. Yeah, I just, I mean, going beyond December, what I imagine would be ten months. I think at that point, I'd want to like review what we're doing, and I'd want it to come back. I mean, if we haven't decided by then, I think it'd be a matter of just extending. I don't imagine it being too significant a thing to bring it back. Um, you know, it goes high as 12 months, but 18 seems like way too much to me. Director Fong. 
I understand giving them flexibility and the timeline we're thinking about, you know, he's, he quoted seven to eight months. I'm thinking with the kind of community support we need and really getting things off the ground so it's a positive outcome, we may need longer. I would go for 12 because 18 sounds a little far. And, you know, this company has a lot of integrity. We worked with them before. Uh, I would trust them at 12 months. I'm not sure where 100,000 came out of. 100,000, well, it's 120 based on um, Dr. De La Cruz's mom, but it, here it says 39,000 and 51,000. So that's about 90,000. So I just stopped it above that, but 120 made more sense to me. I can see where we can put some outer caps like that. And then I don't think it'd be too much of a burden for us to approve any extensions if we have to. I guess that's kind of where I'm at is I don't, I don't, if we can just vote on, on an extension, why would we do that? Why would we upfront try to quantify what an unknown that we couldn't possibly, we, we just can't possibly know. I mean, we're looking at the numbers and it just sounds like we're making more work for staff when we could just bring it back to the board, knowing in advance that maybe we'll need another month or two month extension. I don't, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of what would- Because right now there's no time frame. Exactly. Without the time frame that doesn't require us to bring it back, it would just be at the direction of the board, at whether the we continue the, the work or not. Director Medina, this is your motion. Would you like to make another amendment to your motion or to- Well, if there's would you like no, to no second to it, then it doesn't. Just dies out, and we could just move on to motion to approve it as presented. Okay. Is there a second for Director Medina's motion? Okay, so now in the process, then this motion dies, and now we will move forward uh, with F five as it's as it is written, as the contract is written, and we are seeking a motion on this item. We have to approve five. Second. That was moved by Director Fong and seconded by Director Sheffield. F5. Yes, F5, thank you. Um, do we need to take public comment on this item? No? Okay, so roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director McNally. Aye. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Aye. President Manieri. Aye. Thank you. That brings us to item G1, approval of minutes of the regular board meeting held really, on February really 8th, quick. 2023. Um, oh, sorry. Before we move on, could I just make sure that on the uh, attachments in the minutes, those totals get corrected on the contract amounts? And, and maybe that it includes that the total doesn't include the barns or amount. We'll make sure to to update that that summary. And my apologies for the for the typo on there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item G one: Approval of minutes of the regular board meeting held on February eighth, twenty twenty three. Seeking a motion for approval. I'd like to move to approve. Second. That was moved by Director De La Cruz and seconded by Director Fong. Roll call vote, please. Director Bowie. Aye. Director De La Cruz. Aye. Director Fong. Aye. Director Sheffield. Aye. Director McNally. Director Flores. Aye. Director Medina. Abstain. President Manieri. Aye. Now, H, board member requests for information. Are there any board members who would like to request information at this time? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Oh, I'm sorry, Director De La Cruz. Wondered if I could get a list of all of the classes at all of our secondary sites that qualify for meeting the ethnic studies graduation requirement for the class of 2025? That one sure. A list of the classes that meet the ethnic studies graduation requirements for the class of 2025 at all our secondary sites. Uh, yes, and I believe we've already provided that in a former information item, but I will make sure that it is clear. Okay, thank you. Any other requests for information? Director Medina. Can I just add to uh, Director De La Cruz's request that we also um, include 
for classes that are being offered uh, enrollment numbers for those classes as well. And I believe that was also in that information item. So we will pull that up and make sure we make any adjustments. Thank you. Any other requests? Okay, moving on to I, our information items. These are listed in our agenda packet. I will just read them quickly. Number one is future board discussion items. Number two is our board of conduct and code of ethics. Number three is educational acronyms and abbreviations. Number four, it's 2023 ballot for CSBA delegate assembly. And number five are our school site reports from Lewis Early Learning Academy and Albert Biela Elementary School. Before we adjourn, Superintendent Trinnell, are there any last announcements? Thank you everyone for your time this evening and for the diligence in the discussions tonight um, and for all of those who joined us. Uh, we appreciate your input and um, your partnership in the work that we do. Thank you. And that adjourns our meeting at 9.39 p.m.